Great. I believe that um, technically we have a quorum, if I if I'm counting correctly. So, everybody ready? Shall we get going? Thanks, Kari. All right. Well, welcome all to um, it's our first regular board meeting of the month of October. Uh, if I could just remind everyone, if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. And if you're on the phone, star six is the, um, is the function that mutes your phone and unmutes your phone if you're already muted. Um, just a couple of uh, attendance items. Stephen Look is uh, detained by pressing business at work. So he'll join us if and when he can. Um, Dorothy Naylor is, uh, has some internet issues. So we're hoping that she'll be able to join either at a Wi-Fi hotspot or by phone. Um, so, um, and, and I noticed that it's, it's blowing pretty hard by turns out there. So if a tree falls down and knocks somebody off um, the internet, uh, if it's me, then Floor, you know what to do, right? <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, good, and, and also uh, out of deference to, uh, to those board members who have both stronger stomachs and um, a keener appetite for political debate than I do, um, we're gonna try to wrap up in time for, um, for the vice presidential candidates debate. So um, hoping that that will work out for everybody. Um, anyway, uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening. Um, reception of guests, uh, I guess everybody who's not a board member is, um, is most welcome um, as our board members, of course. And uh, on this particular occasion, Ordinarily, we have public comments after agenda revisions, if I'm not mistaken, but um, this time we'll go first with public comments. And um, for public comments, if I may ask, uh, please raise your hand, either if you click on the participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom box and see raise hand, uh, if you're joining by phone as a member of the public and wish to speak, please press star nine, which will show up on my um, on everybody's screen as a raised hand. Um, that will help us keep everything in order. And, and just to remind, um, we welcome your interventions, members of the public. Please, when you introduce yourselves, let us know which town you're from. And uh, in this segment, we board members listening, we will, um, we will address concerns or uh, any, any aspect of what you're discussing that bears on our business at the appropriate point in our agenda, or if I, we'll get back to you in one way or another. So, um, with that, if I may invite members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question to please raise your hand. And um, if there's a line, we'll call on you in turn. Thank you. And if there's not, we will proceed to agenda revisions. Um, I'm seeing a raised hand uh, from Danielle Lafleur Brooks in the box, please. Hi, I'm Danielle. I'm from East Montpelier. Um, I'm a parent of two students who are attending remote school, an eighth grader who is thriving. I want to give a shout out to Amy Molina and the Watercore team who are doing beautifully, and I am so grateful. 
I have a third grader who is in deep distress because of being removed from, from Kate Robb's classroom. Uh, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my role as a parent and my role as an educator and what I'm seeing. Um, as a parent, I have a, um, so what happened uh, is that on Monday morning a week ago, while I was helping my child with her email, she was in class with, with Kate Robb, there was an email message that said, welcome to third grade. And I thought it was a phishing scheme. I didn't, um, I, I didn't see the email anyplace else. I then went back to my email. I went in my junk mail. There was a, a Gmail uh, address um, and that I didn't recognize. I forwarded it on, fully expecting this was a phishing scheme to find out that my child was no longer to attend Miss Rob's third grade. And I don't know if any of you have eight-year-olds or work with eight-year-olds, but our, my eight-year-old had just gone through three weeks of class, um, had formed relationships with the teacher and classmates. We've worked so hard on rhythm and it was such a shock. She's asking me, what have I done wrong? Why can't I go to my class? I'm planning the remote whole school meeting. I, I want to meet the first graders. So we had a really hard entry level to this change. And, and I've, the district has apologized and I, I, I doesn't have to be perfect. But it was like having an eight-year-old go into school and say, no, you can't go into room 12. You, gotta, you have to actually leave the building and you need to get there yourself. And the door might be locked and um, I can't help you. I mean, there was, okay, so, so there's that part. So it's taken a while to realize that she really can't be in Miss Rob's classroom. So this Monday, so by Friday afternoon, last Friday, at two, three o'clock, I really understand. I get the message that it, that's it. You've got to, you're not going back to Miss Rob's classroom. So I, this, this Monday morning at by six, we, we don't have the correct password. We don't have the correct landing page to access the Canvas course. course. I know that there's a meeting at 8.30, from 6 a.m. to 8.30, my wife and I are working frantically trying to get into the classroom. Meanwhile, my daughter is saying, well, I, do I go to Miss Rob's classroom? Who is my new teacher? How do I, what am I gonna do? What's my, okay, so there's all of that. She gets to the classroom and is not welcomed and she logs herself out in tears. She's crying, she can't understand. She logs herself into Miss Rob's classroom. I try again, please, there's this chat, log into the chat, you know, so she logs into the chat and all that's received that I can see that she's receiving is, um, okay, you need to go watch this video and then you need to watch this video and then you need to log into this part and then you can submit the assignment. And she's so frustrated. She's in tears again, she's leaving the room. This has happened, so I'm on Wednesday, I'm on day three of crying over not being able to understand why she can't be in the classroom and she can't access what she's supposed to be switching to. Okay, that's like the parent role and the child role. And my kids regressed her. She's talking like she's three. She's carrying around her huggy. Uh, okay, so I'm going to set that aside. Now I'm going to speak as an educator. Okay, so I, thankfully, lots of people have talked to me. I'm grateful. As of, I think it was Friday, Monday, Monday maybe, I talked to Jen and she had not yet been able to get into the classroom. Somebody made, it seems to me that somebody made the decision for to switch to this classroom without actually looking at it and seeing what it is. Um, when this decision was made, I can see that it's a cost neutral budget. This decision is a cost, it's neutral to the budget, but my eight year old's paying a cost, my family's paying a cost, the, there are seven third graders, six of them have not been able to make the transition yet. That's 86% are not 
be able to make this transition. I want to know about who's thinking about trauma-informed practices. I have an eight-year-old who could not go to school as of March, who has worked so hard to now be learning remote. And that's because I have a, we have a high-risk family member. Your remote families, I want to say, are the people who are the least, have the least amount of risk tolerance. We are at risk for some reason or another, and we're being asked to be incredibly flexible without support. Back to educator role. Okay, what I see happening in Miss Rob's classroom is phenomenal. I see a person who's teaching children to use technology to connect to real people. There's direct instruction. There's the ability to monitor and adjust and meet the needs of those students. This morning I heard her ask a child, have you had breakfast? Yes, take time to go have breakfast. This other experience is completely different. There, it's a preset program out of Florida what I can understand from it, there is so little flexibility. We are 24 modules behind, 36 months. We're going into the fifth week of school. My daughter's saying to me, she told me if I don't get 100% on this, I can't progress to the next module. She's, I'll, I'm not seeing direct instruction. I'm not seeing monitoring and adjusting. I hear that this is a gold standard program. And I bet it is for independent learners who start at the same time, who are not in trauma. This gold standard program may not be able to meet the needs of people who are eight and 10. And so I'm frustrated. I understand everyone is doing the best they can. These are extraordinary times. I really, my first preference is, is that a teacher is hired who can take from what Miss Rob has done, the routine, the learning methods, the ability to understand uh, reading levels and math levels, what they've already done, and create a routine that children can, that there's something familiar. There's a person that's familiar, there's a rhythm that's familiar, that there's anything that's familiar, so they can transition. That's my first, that's my first request. If that's not possible, please hire teacher aides. You know, if, well, probably the first thing to do is to go to the teachers to ask them what they think should be done because they know the children, they know the curriculum, they know the teaching methods, they know the rhythm. So I'm out of step there. I would defer to the teachers, definitely. But hire aides, break, send them into break, breakout rooms. Okay, if that's not possible and we must go with this program that does not appear to be flexible, has not yet shown itself to be flexible, we still need resources. We need People, I need somebody from the school to say, to gather those third graders and say, you know, you haven't done anything wrong. You're not being pushed out of your class because of anything you've done. We need to make an adjustment. You look at how far you've come in five weeks. Look at this community. Look what you've accomplished. Look, you've gotten to know the fourth graders. You've participated in an all school meeting. Here is your new teacher. Here is where to show up, how to show up. Um, there, we still need resources. Somehow we need resources. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, uh, others who uh, might have public comment to give, if you're able to raise your hand. Um, Jessica. Uh, Jessica, um, I I'm sorry, we, we can't actually hear you. It doesn't appear that you're muted, but it's possible that your mic isn't working. Um, yeah, uh, we still are unable. Hi. Yeah, uh, that sounds good. Can you hear me? All right, perfect. Uh, my name is Jessica Hines and I'm also a parent um, from East Montpelier. Um, I've prepared a written statement. Uh, good evening, my name is Jessica Hines and my daughter is a third grader in the remote learning class. I wanna start off by thanking the board members that have reached out to me regarding an email I sent on September 28th, outlining my concerns about this remote learning situation. I won't go over all the little details as I clearly laid them out in the email, but I will summarize 
our family's experience by saying that my eight-year-old daughter was thriving in the learning community under the direction of Kate Robb was outsourced to a teacher in Missisquoi. What I want to do, however, is talk about the district's elementary remote learning option document that is located on the COVID-19 district website. For those of you who are not familiar with this document, it outlines the district's elementary remote option based on the feedback that was received from students, families, faculty, and staff. Based on the document, it's very clear that students will be either, will be with other students within our district and teachers will be licensed district teachers. A curriculum that is aligned with what is being taught in our schools and connected to the same SLOs as all district in-person schools will be taught and more synchronous learning than in the spring. Another important part of this document is the adherence to six guiding principles, the big ideas and values that the district holds about education. They are equity, relationships are at the center of learning, balance of on and off screen time, predictability, alignment with district learning objectives, and formative assessment. With a move to the VTVLC program, some of these guiding principles no longer are true. We have been in school for five weeks now and my daughter has developed a wonderful relationship with her teacher. She feels confident and comfortable asking questions and enjoys learning with other students that she will eventually be with at U32. The synchronous learning that Kate Rob provides is wonderful and they have become a tight 3-4 learning community. As an educator, I know there is a direct correlation between a positive student-teacher relationship and academic success. Conversely, my eight-year-old under the VTVLC program will, will be required to do her academic work asynchronously with optional synchronous morning meetings. Can you imagine how isolating it would be to a young child to no longer feel connected to her teacher and classmates? Can you imagine how challenging it would be for an eight-year-old to be in charge of her learning? I understand the difficulty in teaching 31 students, and I'm aware that a new plan had to be made, but I'm bothered that in the two and a half months that we've known about this problem, there's been no transparency in the decision-making process, which ultimately left us with one option that is unsatisfactory. Why have we not explored hiring some part-time co-teachers to reduce the load on the remote teachers? Why have we not made use of our in-house interventionists? We haven't, why haven't we examined our current remote teachers FTE and redistribute to make a more equitable workload? For a district whose hallmark is to do what is best for children above all else, I'm confused and disappointed by the lack of creativity and out of the box thinking on behalf of the kids. I was not expected to be blindsided with a complete upheaval of my child's academics and sense of belonging. I have worked in this district for 15 years and I know that we pride ourselves on keeping the students at the center of all decisions. I know that we don't make decisions without thoughtfully vetting them and we are exceptional at thinking outside the box when a challenge arises. At least that's what has happened in the past. The entire experience of being a remote learning parent has made me question what the district's real guiding principles are. I'm confused. Are we changing our guiding principles in an effort to save a dollar? Is it the school board's intention to let these decisions be made and accept their negative ramifications or will you do your due diligence to maintain a high academic rigor, no matter whether in person or remote. I'm confident that a decision will occur that will yield a positive option, rather than the one that's on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have other public comments. Um, if you can, uh, I, I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone. There are four screens worth of participants. And um, other public comments? If not, um, just, just to recap, both Danielle and Jessica are, um, are commenting on remote learning. And we will be addressing that in this meeting at 4.1.1 under superintendent reports. So um, I hope you'll both be able to stick with us uh, through that and through the board um, discussion 
that at that time. Um, now, uh, if there are no other public comments, let's move on to agenda revisions, if we may. Um, uh, are there any? Um, I wonder if Dorothy has been able to join us. Um, I don't see that she has. Anybody else who might have um, an agenda revision to propose? Scott, this is Diane. I don't have an agenda revision, Hello. but my, my Wi-Fi is blinking in and out. So I, I prefer to have my video on, but I need to turn it off. But I just don't want people to think I'm being disrespectful. None of us would ever dream that it would be such a thing, Diane. It's never happened before. And and um, I, I hear um, I hear a phone, a phone voice. Hi, Do this is Dorothy. I, Dorothy. Sorry, this is the first time I've first time I've done it by phone, and I I forgot to hit star. But here I am. <laughs> um, I We're would like before. to suggest an agenda of revision to move um, uh, the 4.2 to be the absolute last thing on the agenda, and then we can get through it as far as we can and uh, possibly adjourn before 9 o'clock. Um, yes, uh, Dorothy, if I'm not mistaken, this is so that we can be done in time for the vice presidential debates? Yes, that's what I have requested. Okay. Um, is there any objection among board members to shifting the policy committee uh, segment of the agenda to the end of our meeting? Policy. Nope. nope. Okay, great. Many thanks. So 4.2 will now um, follow eight at this point and will be the last thing we do before we adjourn. Sound good, everybody? Great. Yes. Okay, excellent. Scott, so, I just wanna say my internet is, is acting up really weird. I'm gonna to try to log out and log back in because I can't, I hear intermittent. I'm, I apologize, that's why I have my camera off. So I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna to try to log back in and see if that helps, okay? Uh, absolutely, Flora, this, is, this seems to be going around. Really, today. really windy here, so. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, sorry. Sure. Um, I'm in Scott, yes. this is, this is Chris, and I'd like to see if we could have a very brief uh, executive session um, before we uh, do any personnel issues on a personnel matter. Um, uh, very brief executive session. Yes, before please. Before we do any, before we take any personnel actions. So are, are you right. proposing that this come between a uh, consent agenda yeah. and the yeah yes yes please okay yep. so um between number the what you see on your board packet as number five consent agenda and number six personnel action chris is proposing a brief executive session um are there any board member objections to this i'm not seeing any objections so um, may it be so. All right. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, other agenda revisions before we move on. Great. So um, 2.4, accept U32 recommendation for uh, a second student representative. Um, Brian, shall I? Start with you. Uh, uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, the uh, U32 administration and Stephen Dellinger Pate in particular for working uh, uh, to identify another student representative to the Washington Central Unified Union School District School Board. Uh, 
and I there it, it is in our packet on page three. But I just wanted to welcome Anna Farber to be appointed uh, to the board as a student representative to serve for two years. And is uh, anyone from Unit Thirty Two want to add something? Uh, I see Jody's here. Uh, then we want to add anything about uh, Anna? I see you clapping. So. I think she'll be a great addition and she's got some great ideas about how to bring elementary student voices to the board. So excited to have Anna join town. Yes, and I'm very excited to uh, work with her. Wonderful. Very happy to hear it. And welcome, Anna, from um, on behalf of all of us, if I may Thank you. say so. Great. Um, and as it happens, I, you get to um, you get to come for your debut performance right after Towns. We'll let him be your warm up act. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, oh, wait actually, a minute before I start, Brian is signaling. Yeah, yeah I just want to. I don't know if uh, the board wants to just uh, officially accept Anna Farber as the U thirty two student representative. I don't know if you have to do a vote or not. I don't or know either. Like um, or shall we shall we accept her by um, universal acclaim? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I love the variety of gestures too. <laughs> Diversity and expression is a great thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so Anna, welcome uh, officially by um, by acclamation. So. Um, Towns, if you would, please. Yeah, I I'd love to. Um, actually, I believe if um, Anna is uh, comfortable, uh, if she would like to join me in the student report. Sure. Um, sweet. So uh, the first thing is that um, this Monday is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So the students will not be attending school, but teachers will be using this day um, for in-service. So um, students will have a, a three-day weekend and a reduced school week. Um, um, do you want to do the next one? Yeah. Okay, so on the 14th, which is this coming Wednesday, we have PSATs. Yes, um, lots of testing for everyone in uh, most and for most high school students. Um, sports games have actually started happening in all of the usual fall sports um, like soccer and football, field hockey, and cross country. I don't know if I'm missing any. That's right. Um, within these weeks that have just passed, we've also started having um, more expanded food service as um, including, you know, sandwiches, salads, hot meals to all the students and it's all free until Dece December. Um, and also, you know, a month of, of school has passed and students have, um, hybrid students have started adapting to the uh, constant change in their schedule and, and uh, the fully in-person middle school has also, um, people have started settling into the, the, the swing of things. That's, that's our student report. Wonderful. And you coordinated it together. <laughs> yes. That, that's, that's fantastic. And Anna, may I ask, do you write for the Chronicle? I was part of journalism last year. Last year? You're not still doing it this year? It's been a little bit busy. I'm going to probably start up at some point again. OK, great. Um, I was just curious. and. Um, both uh, towns. Are you writing yeah. for the Chronicle? Yes, yes. I uh, I am going to be uh, doing a lot of Chronicle stuff this year. Hopefully, great. Um, it would be it it would be terrific if you know um, you felt comfortable, kind of carrying over some of your uh, what you learn and what you're doing at the Chronicle to the board meeting. Absolutely, I can do that. Um, one of the uh, the Chronicle is one of the few ways that we board members have of, of kind of getting a, a sense of how students are thinking at U32. So it's very valuable and to have it 
coming from, you know, in person where we have a chance to even ask questions, even better. Yes, stay tuned everyone for some awesome stuff and come your way, hopefully pretty soon. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks very much, Tans and Anna. Um, any board members have questions for uh, one or the other of them or both? If not, um, we can proceed once again with thanks and a hearty welcome to you, Anna. Um, move on to board governance goal, which um, has a document attached at page four. So did Fleur manage to make it back on? Fleur, are you? Um... Yes, I am. Oh. I am. I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry, my internet is acting up. I'm going to try to turn it on. I already had everybody moved away of, so we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, are, are you in a position where um, we're to discuss the board governance goals, um, the draft that, um, that Jill suggested? Yes. Yes, hold on a minute. I'm... There. Sorry, I had turned everything off to try to get <laughs> to see if I could get the internet Quite all right. to work. Yeah, but at least the wind seems to have stopped here. So I think that should work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm opening my document. Uh. This is my first board meeting since my nest became empty, and I'm really noticing the improvement of the Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to. Uh, we can. Oh, um, you. I got it. I got it. So got it, it? Just, it was just taking, it was just doing that little circle thing. The so, wheel of death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the wheel of death. But it's open. <laughs> uh, so so we had a we had a meeting. Uh, uh, our agenda planning uh, committee had a had a meeting and we talked about uh, the governance goals and we wanted to run this by you to get your input. So so we decided. That, we want to suggest that the school board will develop superintendent job description by a certain, we haven't decided what, what date and complete the superintendent evaluation, which we all know is part of our job, but that is a concrete goal that we know that we can monitor and, and achieve, hopefully. And then goal number two as governance would be the school board will formalize board roles and operations by completing the following, creating uh, board norms, uh, Create board roles and descriptions and have board members complete board training and we're including communication. If, if, yeah, if board training, the, what is in parentheses is basically sort of one of some of our brainstorming that I think will come up as, as we discuss. So no need to talk about that right now. And the school board will conduct a needs assessment to evaluate the district's progress towards focusing on learning as a unified uh, district. So we wanted to open that for discussion. And before we, we get started, uh, I, I'm going to share with you guys. I just got it today. I was hoping to get it before. But as far as getting us focused on goal number on goal number two, uh, talking with the Harwood uh, board, they've developed a document that I think could serve us as a starting, as a starting point that we could develop is, is literally a board manual, but it has a lot of the things that we discussed on the, on, on the meeting. So I'm, I'm happy to share that with everybody in, and, and work the document for our next meeting. I just wanted to put that, uh, that suggestion up. So we, it's open for discussion. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about this uh, achievable goals, hopefully? <laughs> Board members, um, maybe we can start with those who were who were at the meeting. Um, Jill, since you uh, you sort of th this is kind of the um, the offspring of your chat box. 
Oh, I, I think Floor summarized it well. I, you know, what I tried to do in the in the agenda meeting was really just capture what I think I was hearing. So, um, so this was my my attempt to just capture the our effort to try to make this concrete. So I think I would actually defer to board members who who weren't there who may have some questions about what we discussed and and came up with. Um, I have a question, Scott, if that's okay. Caroline, of course, please. Um, you had emailed us something that you said would <clears throat> help with this. And I'm not sure if you were, uh, and it's, I'm sorry, with all the, I need like three devices because I want to keep the agenda open, but I also want to have what you sent us. But I thought that it had to do with this, but then when I read it, it looked more like, um, I wasn't sure if you were suggesting that we already had a job description or that it would somehow help us fill in these blanks. So that was my sort of, I guess, procedural question of, can you, Scott, explain how you saw what you sent us as helping with this discussion? And I don't sure. mean to imply that it won't, I'm just trying to figure <laughs> out what, what it's, what, we're, yeah. Sure, of course. Um, just for the benefit of those who might not have seen it, what I what Caroline is referring to is a um, is a paragraph of the board's contract with the superintendent that discusses, uh, among other things, evaluation, and the um, Basically, what it uh, and now um, because I don't have multiple devices open, I'm speaking from the one device I can least rely on. Um, that we would come up with an evaluation process by November 15, um, and that we would complete the superintendent evaluation by July 15, and we would, in any event, give the superintendent. 30 days advance notice that we intended to complete that evaluation by whatever date we do, if it isn't, if it's before July 15, say. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I just wanted that to be out there. The, because a, uh, an evaluation process uh, is, it includes more than a job description. We might want to have the job description actually completed before um, November 15. And um, that would be my hope anyway. So that's what that was all about. Thank you. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, Great. thank you. No, thank you, Caroline. Um, Uh, Fleur. So I, I think just to move us back a little bit. So, so today, I think our intent was just to, to set, give us some guidance of achievable dates, maybe like, you know, just try to set that, that calendar for right now. And then we would go about the process because I think in order to have that superintendent evaluation, uh, Brian also needs some clear goals for, from us too, so that we make sure that he's helping us achieve those goals as part of of his job uh, description too. And I, I, I don't, I'm looking at him knowing how my, hearing what Caroline said and what you just said, Scott, trying to achieve it's uh, October 7 already and having the job description for November 15, since that job description is pretty old. Uh, what, what a realistic time frame is for you that won't interfere with the other stuff that you need to be, uh, that you need to be doing. So, we could let you think about it. You don't need to answer that today, but with that in mind, we can try to set just even not at a specific date, but at a month that we want to have this guys achieved by. Ryan. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, you know, there, I think there's a lot of things about process, right? Well, how we want to uh, develop my job description. Um, there, there. Uh, I did do some homework in the job description area for Vermont superintendents. Uh, I did uh, ask the uh, Vermont Superintendents Association and uh, 
They said they would get back to me. They did get back to me uh, just recently uh, and provided me with several different types of job descriptions. Uh, speaking with different superintendents, there's also, um, you know, do we want to also, I know you have, we're looking at board member, you know, board, school board member uh, responsibilities slash job descriptions themselves for yourselves as well. So we have a clearly delineated um, gu uh, guide between governing roles versus management roles, right? So, uh, so the idea is that we have it, uh, we have it kind of in writing and what that looks like, because uh, that's always the uh, that's where that's where the rubber always hits the road in school board uh, and, and superintendent relations. Uh, I would think that uh, uh, if it if it seems very ambitious you know, to have it by November fifteenth, um, I think when this contract was drawn up, uh, we it was right before COVID and all that. So uh, you know, it was a pre-COVID uh, idea. So I, I think you know, if we have to have a, a, a extend it by two weeks or into the December meeting, I'd be I would be amenable to that. I do think um, it would be helpful to get a job description up and running for the superintendent and also the board roles and the board no norms and maybe a board job description. So we have our ideas of what that what that should be. And then um, I did also talk about, uh, there's different ways of doing superintendent evaluations. So I think that that's another conversation that we probably should have uh, in an executive session because it involves my personnel uh, file and personnel uh, documents. So I think there's opportunities to talk about what I will be evaluated on. Uh, so if we're working on the job descriptions for superintendent and board members and, and board norms and those documents, we work on that. We can also have some sort of executive session, I think, in the near future to discuss what types of processes are out there. And at the same time, working while at the same time developing those pieces, developing our board goals, because I think the board goals will ultimately inform any evaluation. That That's like the content piece of the evaluation, right? Uh, did you make your goals? Uh, did you achieve your goals? What, 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 did, what actions did you take to uh, achieve your goals? What are some, some things? And, and I think that's really where, you know, again, the rubber hits the road. So I would be in, in favor of, um, you know, if you want to push it forward a month to get us into December to give us some more time because of the, the pandemic, but make this probably a, some sort of standing agenda item where we're, we're talking about getting board, the board to adopt goals, adopt um, board responsibilities and the superintendent responsibilities. And, and, and I can definitely focus on that work uh, for the foreseeable future. Sounds good. So, um, so Fleur, uh, it, it sounds as though Brian is suggesting that um, there will be some, some preliminary work to be done separately by him um, that we can then kind of coalesce around in an executive session at some point in the future. Um, how about the other stuff, the um, board norms, I, some of that uh, is related, as Brian pointed out just now, um, board norms, board roles, board goals. But how would you see that? What kind of process would you like to, um, do you think should unfold to get at the rest of, let's say two and three? I, I was thinking, thinking that we would set uh, a date by, we would, that we would bring something back to the board to reflect on, not try to create it right at the, because we don't have enough time, but maybe the, again, the same committee that since we're in charge of doing the agenda, it put together something for them to reflect possibly at our next uh, board meeting, a, a draft, and then uh, say that by November, because we can't really be operating much longer without norms and, and roles. I don't think we really need to reinvent the wheel and what those are. So maybe say that by November, that's an achievable goal for us. Let's say that by, by November, uh, we would have uh, the board description and the board norms, or is that too ambitious? I'm, I'm just putting it out there. I don't wanna be the only one saying uh, when, but I think a lot of these things are, are there. They're just not. Uh, and then we we would have two meeting two or three meetings to, or as a as a board to talk or not talk about. A, we might be able to do it in one meeting, but it might take two meetings. But at least we know that by November, 
you know, 15 or whatever it is, we have norms and board roles and descriptions. So that would take care of goal number two. So um, what do board members think about November 15 as a target? Um, Any objection? No objection, um, but can I, um, is there any documentation of defining what board goals or, well, I'm sorry, board roles or board norms um, are? Um, and I think I, from a previous meeting, the folks from U, the U32 board previously said that they had a pretty uh, defined set of board norms. Um, if, if that's true, uh, were they written down anywhere um, so that we can take a look at them? We would, we would be bringing it back to you. Uh, Scott had sent some stuff, but there is also, if, as, as far as uh, governors, there's some stuff from the Vermont Agency of uh, Education that sort of sort of drafts what the roles and responsibilities of, of the board members are. We could start with that and give us something to, to frame the conversation. And then we, we talk about those. How does that sound? And then we'll bring both the, uh, Scott's ideas on the norms, the document that he had sent us, uh, the other not document that we had received from U32 that I think I had shared with you guys. And then we we would bring some, uh, like a mixture of that for you guys to reflect on so that we don't have to do everything at, at that board meeting. How does that sound? Um, that, that sounds fine. Um, but when I'm looking at this, this um, document of board governance goals, it does not seem to incorporate any of the structural, um, um, any of the structural changes or st structures that we talked about when we were reading the, the Rice book. Uh, and in particularly um, creating avenues of communication between the different um, stakeholders uh, in the district. Uh, and that seemed to me to be one of the more significant parts of the Rice book um, in terms of creating a much more fluid communication um, structure uh, between the board and the various stakeholders in the in the um, in the professional learning organization. Uh, so I don't I don't see that here, um, and I think that if we're going to talk about governance as a, uh, a structural entity, uh, we should be incorporating some of those principles as well. I think this is where the needs assessment part yeah. comes in. Yeah, Scott is absolutely so, right that, that we came up with with that to try to there was a, how we got consensus around the group of people that met was to a, if you go into into your book actually a, when you have a chance a, Chris you will see that the is 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 part of the of the book is to conduct that needs assessment and evaluate the the district progress towards focusing on learning so it's one of the pieces a, we didn't put a a date on that yet, but yes, you're 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 right. We're not trying to leave that behind. In the book, is the needs assessment done done before the structure is created or after the structure has been created? Is is the first the step? Is the first structure. step? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. So. Um, so we're looking at November 15 to bring something to the board. Um, and it would be, well, be November 18 when we would be done, right? Is that, isn't that what we were saying? And they, I had a, I was just looking at the calendar right now. I was, uh, so it would be November, uh, let me see. No, actually November 21st will be the second Wednesday. November, Sorry, 21st. November, November 18 is, it would be the second Wednesday of November and November 4th. Right. So we would bring something to the board. It, it, at the next meeting, we're doing quality stuff. So maybe we would bring the first draft to the board November 4th. Is that make sense to everybody? Sure. Okay. So Kari keeps waiting so patiently with his hand up, but I am not oh, as patient I, I as he is. So I want to make sure Kari. you're seeing that he keeps trying and he's yeah, not getting called um, on. I'm so sorry, Kari. <laughs> I, I, 
No I don't know where you are. There you are. Um, please, my apologies. You've actually um, answered many of my questions while I was um, waiting patiently. So um, I, I guess the, the one thing I'll um, uh, emphasize is that on the on the goal number one there, um, I think that it might be missing a step, which is this, you've got the job description and that's the big picture. We need that obviously. We've got the evaluation, that's a process that has to happen. I feel like it's important for Brian's sake to be clear on what the basis of the evaluation is going to be sooner than later. So if that's gonna be, you know, first year goals or um, here's, here's the categories we're gonna be looking at. I think it's only fair because we're not, I don't see us evaluating them on the full job description in year one during a pandemic where we're already halfway into the year by the time we get back to them with this information. So I would add a line, add a phrase in there about um, what the criteria of the evaluation are going to be and if there's a specific goal or something like that so that he has a chance to um, try to accomplish that prior to the evaluation being completed. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Um, thank you very much. Uh, other anybody else? I I'm I'm not able to um, I'm not able to see who is trying to speak. Jonas, Jonathan, did I miss either of you? Jonas, um, is anyone familiar with what the VSBA offers in terms of superintendent evaluation services? They say they do it. I haven't looked too far into this. Up in the northwest there. So, yes, Brian, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I actually uh, was just, uh, I'm, I was anticipating this, this uh, topic uh, coming up. So I've been trying to gather up different superintendent evaluation processes. The VSBA does do a training. Uh, they do do a, a, a training that you can purchase uh, and you can hold like a workshop or with them or, you know, an executive session talking about personnel and, uh, you know, how you want to do how you want it depends on how you want to use it and they'll talk to you about the different pieces that are in a superintendent's evaluation uh it is it could be different uh if, or it could be something exactly as they, they 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 basically give you different options that you can consider so it is it could be informative uh it does cost money uh, it does uh but they do paint a picture of what that could look like so th this is the second bunch of stuff you say you've gathered i would love to see that you know, if you, if you could put a pa packet together with all those uh, job descriptions and, and that stuff. Yeah, okay. Great, okay. Um, do we have enough then to, um, to proceed? Wonderful, okay. I have um, one question. Please. Um, and then Kari after you, Caroline. Okay, and it's both, procedural for outside of this and specific to this one. If I had an idea or um, something I wanted the committee to consider during their needs assessment, let's say, um, part, so one is like, who's on that committee? So who would I send it to? But then the second part is, I wanna be really careful not to do um, work outside of a meeting. And so what happened, I, I had this, thing from the last meeting. Now I can't even remember what it was, but I thought to send almost like a draft statement. But then Scott had emailed something very specific that mine would have been very similar. So I chose not to send it because I thought it would look like work outside of a meeting. So where do we stand on that? What, what, if I don't want to take up time now going into the needs assessment because that's not what this meeting is for, but I don't want it to get lost and I'm not on the committee. What would the board suggest? Sure. Um, it, uh, I'll, give you, I'll take a shot at those two questions and then Great. Um, my colleagues will, will modify uh, or correct as necessary. Um, the members, uh, this is the agenda setting, setting committee, which includes Floor, Jonas, Jill, Diane, myself, with, of course, Brian as um, the executive. 
um, executive secretary for this committee, if you want to call it that. Um, and in terms of materials, um, the way I interpret the open meeting law, we may not, must not uh, engage in any kind of discussion or deliberation outside of open session um, or in, a, in an executive session that we have entered into as a board. However, in terms of, of pumping out information, um, say if you have a document that you wanna share with everybody, um, please do. Um, we, we may not respond we, we, in the sense that we must not respond, um, but we can, we can take it all in. So um, if you have something great, uh, Floor has something, share it around. Um, and then we come together as a board with these various documents and then in open session, we discuss them. So that, uh, and we, we're not supposed to edit a document, a single document either. So we can't, we can't do Google Docs or anything like that. We have to just push out our own individual contribution. Um, did I get that about right? Okay. Okay, so if you send something and you say that it's about length of school day and you think it should be eight hours and here's your research and I send my own, not replying to yours, but mine is all facts on why it should be seven and a half hours. That's still okay as long as it's not a response or as, mentions yours at all. As long as it's not, yeah. Topic. As long as it's not call and response, it's fine. Okay, it's, yeah. okay. perfect. Um, great, uh, thank you very much. Kari, did you have something? Yeah, a quick point. I just, this is, I think, beyond the scope of this year, but I, I do feel compelled to say it because I think we have a duty to provide an orientation to do new board members. And I think number two is important elements of an orientation. So as the committee is developing these documents, if they can think about it in terms of a new board member being oriented and then what other items we would want to add to that orientation, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Once again, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, um, thank you. Great. Are we ready to proceed to student achievement goal? Um, uh, Kari, do you have the lead on this one? Sure, this will be quick. The uh, Ed Quality Committee met uh, prior to this meeting, we reviewed a draft of two goals, one having to do with a review of student achievement um, data and process, um, and the other having to do with um, the curriculum instructional review um, and expanding that out into developing a strategic plan, an updated strategic plan for the um, district. And so, um, the, and these were based on the, um, the ideas that came out of the retreat. Um, so we talked about them today. We will update a draft and um, expect to provide you with um, draft goals uh, at the next meeting. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, board member questions for Kari? If not, then let's continue on to the um, report, superintendent's report, and 4.1.1, which um, harks back to the public comments on remote learning update. Brian, this is your show. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Scott, uh, members of the board and uh, members of the public. Uh, so basically, uh, there's a remote class size update that was uh, several, almost eight days ago, uh, it's on September 30th, and it just talked about how uh, the district was working to try to uh, improve a situation in our, in our remote learning classes. 
uh, using the Vermont Virtual Learning Co uh, Cooperative and the Washington School District, uh, uh, what we could try to do. So one of the things that we were able to do was we were able to uh, place a math teacher into the Verm Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative and in exchange, uh, we were able to uh, attain uh, seats in the Vermont uh, Virtual Learning Collaborative for grades, students in grade three and students in grade five. Uh, the, 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 we, they were able, these were the only seats that they had available. Uh, this, we were able to place uh, and offer this program to all of the students in grade three and grade five. Uh, the arrangement allowed for uh, two lar the two largest class sizes to decrease and uh, it be more similar to the in-person class sizes throughout the district. Uh, so the uh, class sizes are much smaller uh, now for, for the, the uh, remote uh, teachers. And we're gonna continue to monitor this. This is uh, unfortunately, uh, and I will say to the parents who came today, uh, you know, this is uh, really uh, a, a situation where we have to choose between imperfect options uh, you know, in person, our number one focus in the district is letting is, is in person instruction and uh, trying to that, that's our preferred mode of uh, basic of uh, ways to educate children. Uh, remote learning was added as an option this summer uh, to families to provide them an opportunity. The and, and I think the board uh, I, I applaud the board for supporting that option uh, when we were doing it in the summer. And then, of course, you know, where you know you you make these plans, and then you have to be flexible because things happen. Um, and again, I guess what I would say is it's it was really in, an imperfect option uh, in an imperfect world during an imperfect time. Um, you know, and and as a superintendent, we have to. I, I know I I have to make the best choices uh, at, at at all possible times so we can support all of our kids in the best way that we can. Uh, the imperfect options. Uh, well, I, the way it really, really was played out was there was a one option was to continue with large class sizes in our virtual learning classes, which uh, can be overwhelming for our teachers. Uh, the second one was to uh, send students, sign students up for VTVLC, which I will admit, I will admit that it is a different program than our remote learning uh, classes. Uh, it still, it does provide our students uh, with a with an educational option and a uh, educational uh, and a teacher. Uh, so ultimately, the uh, the uh, choices were made. Uh, I'm the superintendent. Uh, I own all the decisions. Um, it was not a unilateral decision. It was something where we consult. I consulted with my members of my leadership team. Uh, the great thing about the leadership team is we do have a lot of smart people on that leadership team. And uh, thankfully, not everyone always agrees, right? So there's different opinions about VTVLC and the district uh, programs. Uh, at the same time though, given these imperfect options, I really, really uh, did not want to, uh, uh, do not want to have a program at all if we don't have teachers. And I know we can't run a program without teachers. And so I, I just wanted to uh, you know, let the parents know that one of the uh, things that I feel very bad for the parents uh, in the program was the notification uh, of how they were notified. Uh, it, it was unfortunate. We, uh, we did have the remote learning principal try to uh, reach out, uh, left messages, was unable to uh, either get through. And I think this happened uh, quickly on a Friday. Um, and then uh, over the weekend, I, I, apparently the, from, from, from what I've learned is the VTVLC teacher had reached out to the parents before the uh, remote learning principal could get a hold of the uh, parent uh, of the parents and uh, you know I, when I heard this on Monday I was like oh and so we've been trying to figure out a way to uh, give the parents uh, as a transition it's been difficult uh, I will say it's new for our district to do remote learning like, like this I think at the high school they've been doing this for a number of years but at the elementary school it's a learning it's a learning curve for us uh, for as a district at the elementary level and I would also have to say it's also a learning curve for VTVLC. I think uh, one of the um, pieces for VTVLC uh, is th they've been expanding. They've had to expand at a rapid rate, and they have a lot of uh, teachers. And uh, we've been afforded the opportunity 
uh, to ensure we get our children into uh, into VTLVLC. And again, I just feel bad about the notice to the parents. Um, and but at the same time, in an imperfect world, um, these were imperfect options. Thank you, Brian. Um, before I open for board member discussion, I just want to recall that the administration has reached this solution as a result of the board's encouragement to solve the, the problems of um, excess class size and uh, a personnel situation. Um, so anyway, um, this in a sense is, um, I'm sure this, this is sort of like no, no good deed goes unpunished but um, as Brian says, we're trying to deal with imperfect options uh, in an imperfect situation. So, um, but just to recall that the board has already um, sort of had a, a kind of directive role in this. Um, now, board member comments. Um, board members, uh, I, I can only see a few of you on, on the screen at any one time. If you're able to click the raise hand button, that will help me a lot. Caroline. Um, so I don't mean to go first. I just want you to know that I did want to speak. I feel like I've talked a lot at this meeting, so I'll wait and see if there's others, but I just want you to know I do have some things to say. Thanks. That's very generous of you, Caroline. Thanks. Jonas? My video is going in and out because of the internet as well. So if I, you know, my screen pops up and down, that's why. Um, my, uh, I have a, a child in the, what is now the four class. Um, and the, the four remote, the fourth grade remote class. Um, and I have, you know, since, you know, since we learned that this was happening in the third grade was being split off, I've tried to ask him, right, as nonchalantly as possible, um, if the third graders are still in his class or if an announcement has been made that it's just fourth grade now. And he has, he's told me no, that he has no knowledge of that, but Again, he's a fourth grader, so I don't expect that to be totally truthful. Uh, I just like to, to hear what kind of outreach has been done to the fourth graders and the sixth graders who are missing their classmates now. Right. Understanding entirely that my kid is an unreliable narrator. <laughs> well, I, I can let you know, as of right now, I'm not aware of any official outreach uh, to the uh, children in those classes. I do know that uh, the remote learning principal and also now the director of curriculum uh, are working uh, and do have plans to reach out to the third and fifth grade students. I should just mention that there will be an opportunity for public comments towards the end of the meeting. So um, other board Scott? members. Can you Chris, hear Scott? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm not on video, but um, I couldn't connect. So, um, Brian, in, in one of the comments from um, one of the parents, um, I thought there was a reference to the teacher being a Florida teacher. Um, if I misheard that, I apologize. But if I didn't, um, can you can you address that? And also at the same time, just tell. I thought you said that the program was different. Explain how it's different from. Uh, what the remote program was otherwise. Yeah. Sure. So uh, uh, thanks for the question. The uh, so basically the uh, I think the Florida question the question of Florida teachers is uh, not an accurate. Uh, that might be based on uh, erroneous information. I'm not sure. I can't speak for the parent about how she received that information. I did uh, speak uh, with the director of VTVLC. And ultimately uh, what it is, is it's, uh, it's been around since 2009, all, it's all Vermont teachers. Uh, so, uh, this, and schools basically leverage the teachers who cannot teach in person 
uh, and to address families who uh, did not want their children in buildings. Uh, currently, from what I understand, uh, there's about 120 Vermont teachers providing education for 20 school districts uh, in, in the state of Vermont. Uh, it's a Vermont educational community uh, that has come together with support from the Agency of Education, from the Vermont Agency of Education. Uh, so they are uh, working on creating, in, especially in kindergarten through fifth grade, they are working to um, create a cohort of students to develop a sense of community. And what I heard today uh, from uh, some of the parents is, you know, they feel that there has been a, a, a loss of a sense of community uh, in their classes. And I know that uh, we're going to try to work very hard uh, with providing, uh, try to provide a, a more of a sense of community. And I, and I can even uh, ask our director of curriculum to jump in in a second here to talk about some of the work that she's been trying to do uh, to not only transition our uh, remote our remote learners from these student from these cl affected classes, but also how do we uh, how do we uh, try to uh, adequately prepare our students for those transitions? So there's there's definitely some more work that has to be done, but uh, that is something that uh, we are definitely mindful of uh, based on the feedback that we have received from our parents. Uh, I do know that their uh, curriculum is uh, standards based; it is implemented in Canvas. Uh, the program is uh, run differently. Uh, it's less uh, synchronous. So our program is more synchronous. Uh, so the synchronous meaning that you have more uh, in-person instruction happening at the same time versus asynchronous where you have um, modules or things you have to do lessons in, in uh, online and then you can get to uh, meet with uh, meet with the teacher or co come back to the class at a different time. But uh, so right now, as I understand it, there is uh, every every uh, the, every uh, Mondays. Uh, I think I believe they're offering math a math class, forty five minutes to an hour. Tuesdays uh, literacy, Wednesdays is specials. That's something that we're have we have to work on. Uh, Thursdays is science, and Fridays is social studies. And it could be I may have the content areas mixed up on the different days, but I do know that that's what they're doing uh, for about an hour a day of continuous instruction. Um, the uh, other piece that I uh, understand is that uh, they, they also meet with their, uh, with the students uh, for one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, and this I believe happens every other day. So it's at least twice a week or three times a week, uh, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, and they also, the teachers also have online office hours. And, and so it, it, is a di it is a different type of uh, offering. I think the, the um, it, where we get into some of the assumptions behind the programs and they're different, and everyone has different opinions, right? About what's better, what's, what's not better. Um, you know, and I think uh, it uh, comes down to, is synchronous better than asynchronous all the time, right? So. Um, is synchronous learning better? Uh, is it better? I, I, I mean, I think we can definitely all agree that uh, in-person learning uh, in, in the classroom while it's happening in the school building is the most ideal situation. Uh, but again, uh, this is an imperfect uh, uh, time with imperfect options. And uh, I don't know if I get, I hope that gave you enough information with regards to VTVLC. Can I let me ask a follow-up question? Would any of the suggestions uh, that the parents had had in their in their conversation um, or their presentation um, help with the creating a sense of community for the, these uh, students in the BTVLC program? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to let Jen jump in here because uh, she's been working very hard uh, in, in part of it, I know she hasn't been able to get to all of it. So I'll let Jen talk about some of the work that she's been doing in this area. Okay, thanks. 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 So first I wanna clear up the Florida misconception. I think that the confusion came because the curriculum that's being accessed is from an organization called something like the Florida Learning Cooperative or something, something or consortium. 
Um, it is aligned to the national standards and Vermont has adopted the national standards. But I think when, when folks have seen Florida, when they look at elementary curriculum materials and VTLC, that's why, because it came, it was developed in Florida, but in alignment with the national standards. Um, I, I have transitioned into this role uh, not quite a week ago. I've had the opportunity to meet with Jeff Renard and um, who is the director of VTVLC, learn a bit more. And I have right before the Ed Quality Committee meeting today, I've had the opportunity now to have met with both of the teachers, the third grade teacher and the fifth grade teacher. Um, we've been hearing a lot from families. I've been um, trying to reach out to, to most of them. So far, I haven't been able to reach everybody quite yet, but. Um, the, the sense of um, community is going to be really important. Our, our teachers in Washington Central worked very, very hard to establish a sense of community, and that is um, foundational to the social emotional support that we're providing our students um, and the academic support that we're providing our students. So we came today, I was able to meet with the fifth grade students and the fifth grade families to devise a plan along with the, our fifth, sixth remote teacher and the fifth grade remote teacher so that we can um, be clear for families and students so they know what the pathway is, accessing their academic learning through VTVLC, but with opportunities, touch points each day to connect with the larger class um, for read aloud and for a closing reflective meeting each day and allied arts. We, as Brian mentioned, the allied arts are still a work in progress. We're still trying to figure out exactly how to make that happen. It's been um, a trickier schedule wise and coordination wise than I think anybody would have anticipated. That situation that we're um, producing in, in fifth grade right now does not yet exist for third grade. And you're hearing um, tonight from our third grade families is particularly challenging. The classroom is set up in third grade for VTVLC a little differently than the fifth grade scenario. There is less synchronous time in the third grade scenario. And, um, and I just met with that teacher late this afternoon to figure it out. So um, I have a meeting tomorrow morning, first thing, with our uh, third and our fourth grade remote teacher so that we can try to take this information and synthesize and try to wrap around and support our third graders and their families as best we can. But that, that is not, that is still definitely in progress. Thanks, John. Um, other, other board members? Questions. Um, okay. Oh, Caroline, uh, your generosity. I, I don't wish it to go unrewarded. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, because we, it's really hard as board members when we have the um, public comments and then it's not, you know, we don't respond back. And I know why we do that on the agenda and I support that. But I did wanna to say to Danielle and Jessica that um, both of you really did an amazing job of speaking and advocating for your kids. Um, it totally emotionally touched me because I have an eight-year-old um, and I think it was Danielle who brought up eight-year-olds with trauma and like I, it, I got choked up. So I, I just want you to know that um, like as a board member, I, I absolutely feel for you and I heard you and we appreciate you coming. Um, I do feel that this was a decision at the superintendent level. I think that was the appropriate place for, <clears throat> for the decision to be made. And um, so because of that, I don't wanna get involved with, you know, asking a lot as a board member, like, did you do this? Could you consider that? Because I don't think that's our role at this point. Um, we did ask to fix very strongly. We asked to fix the high number situation. Um, personally, I do not think I would have supported any option that required additional funds or staffing. So um, I can very much see how this was. Um, anyway, I'm getting into what I said I wouldn't. So I just want to say, I think it I think it was a superintendent decision. So as a board member, I want to leave it at that. But I want to say to everybody who emailed, 
everybody who spoke, this is a really tough time. I totally agree. Those of you doing the remote learning, you are in a trickier um, <clears throat> situation. And I think that most people made that decision and it was a tough decision to make. Um, and so just know that um, we, we appreciate hearing from you. Thanks. And, and thank you, Caroline. You, you expressed my feelings better than I could have. Um, other, uh, other board members? Lindy. Yeah, uh, you're muted, Linda. Uh, there you are. I got it. I just couldn't find the cursor again. Um, I did have people reach out to me and I followed up and was told that options were looked into. The leadership team was consulted. And those were the questions I had to see if there were other options from within house. And the answer I got was it was a team decision and a committee or a group and not a single person made the decision, which is what I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to hear that we had looked at other options within the district. Thanks, Lindy. I see Brian. Yeah, and I just want to add on to that, that uh, at the end of the day, uh, and I'll back say, re say what uh, Carol Caroline, Caroline just said, uh, the big thing is I consulted with the leadership team there were obviously different opinions about what people think about and uh, what they what they believe, you know, what they believe they could be doing. However, uh, sitting in this chair as this as a superintendent, I bear sole responsibility um, and ownership of that decision. But people were everyone was consulted. Understood. Thank you. Um, so. Um, Board members, anything else? Or shall we continue to um, the search update on the Director of Technology? Okay, let's move forward. Brian. Yeah, uh, before I get there, I th there was just one other thing I just uh, wanted to, uh, it's uh, something I just want to inform the board about. Uh, and that is the, um, uh, and I'll turn this over to Principal Lyford real quick, uh, but we are, uh, East Montpelier is the only uh, school on election day that actually is used for folks to vote on election day. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Alicia. Uh, uh, we, we, as we talked and uh, she developed a great plan uh, for that day. And, uh, so I'll turn it over, Alicia. Thank you, and I'll be quick. Um, so this is one of the silver linings in COVID. I think we had met, I met with the town clerk way back last winter to plan and prepare for this, what's going to be um, you know, a very large election day with a huge turnout. And we had bounced around ideas on how to make it so that children weren't in the building this day, just for safety, because the building is completely open. Um, and then we learned about these remote day options. So this fall, I've been working on developing a plan that I reviewed with staff today. Um, on Tuesday, November 3rd, we will have a planned remote day. Students will get their bagged breakfast and lunch the day before and their Chromebooks and take them home with them on Monday the 2nd, and they will participate in our first trial of a remote day. Um, hopefully under the best circumstances, um, having planned it and the teachers will have time to prepare. We followed the guidance from AOE that the remote school is also following as far as instructional hours and what the day needs to look like. Um, students will still have interventions and in their services. Um, they'll still have their specials on that day and they will um, all be doing it from home. So it'll be a little bit of a trial for the district and I'm happy to report back after the fact how it all goes, but fingers crossed we'll be well prepared. Thanks so much, Alicia. Yeah, and, and this will be important for Callis, I think, coming up in December when we get to that point. And, oh, uh, and I just want to thank, Back to you. thank I did, sorry, I just wanted to thank Princ uh, Principal Lyford, Alicia, for her leadership in this, and, uh, and uh, thank you for your leadership on that, on that role. Um, the uh, other things are, uh, just so uh, folks are aware, the technology director search update, the uh, the, and, and this kind of also goes under the, the talk of, uh, I'll do two at the same time, uh, the, uh, the central office job uh, descriptions as well. One of the uh, 
projects that I tasked myself with when I started was to look at all the central office job descriptions and try to figure out what, what do people do? What are they tasked with? What, are they, what do they think they, their job is? And does it align with what we have on our paper, on our paper saying what their job is? Uh, and, so, and then of course, is there something else that isn't captured in either one of those uh, because uh, maybe there's something that we need to consider looking at. So uh, I was, my goal was to try to do all of them uh, <laughs> before the start of the summer, but of course, pandemic uh, reopening and other things going on. And I realized that it's a lot more of a, a heavy lift than I thought. Uh, so we uh, did a couple of things uh, the, with uh, Keith McMartin, who uh, is now no longer employed in our school district. Uh, he resigned officially October 2nd. Uh, we do have a vacancy and we had posted for that position, but that also created an opportunity to look at the technology director job description. Um, I uh, went to, to and it's, it's a process, so I can describe it to you so you're aware of the process uh, and how we and why it's here tonight. So the uh, idea behind it was uh, let's look at the old job description. Let's bring Keith in to look at the old job description. Tell us what's what's uh what do we need to do? What are some changes that we need to make to the old job description, to the new job description? And uh, then ultimately uh, advertise that new job description uh, in the local newspapers, at week, top school jobs and other things. So we did, we already do have a position, we already do have the old job description that's in school spring uh, that is up. And we do have some folks that are starting to apply for those jobs. Uh, however, it is an older job description and tonight, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be asking you to adopt a new job description. Uh, so I can then go back and repost and send it out to all the groups that are set, are set here on this uh, document. And, uh, and so the big question is, what do we do now, right? We have remote learning, uh, we may have snow day. I don't wanna say, I'm, actually, I'm not gonna say anything about snow days. Uh, no, I see everyone, no, no, I didn't say it. Uh, we have we have a lot of things that could be happening uh, that may require us to have uh, remote learning days. So I, uh, uh, what do we do without Keith McMartin, our, our technology guy? So right now, I've, I, you might be wondering who uh, is on the Zoom, the district Zoom picture, but I'll give him a, an opportunity to introduce himself. He is our technology consultant. He is going to uh, be uh, working here uh, at, at most of the time remotely, but sometimes in person. Uh, he's going to be conducting a, a, a tech needs assessment to help us with our strategy for technology in the district. Uh, and he's also um, going to be working with our tech team. He is a uh, highly sought after consultant. I'm very happy that we have him. Um, I'm happy that we can afford him. Uh, more, more, very important. And, uh, I'll, and I'll just turn him over. He's, again, the stopgap measure to help us in case of a major emergency as well while we're looking for a uh, person to uh, uh, replace Keith. So uh, Jim, Jim Garrity from Diamond Technologies, I'll just have you uh, introduce yourself real quick. Brian, thank you very much. Um, my, my name is Garrity, I'm with Diamond Technologies. We're a systems integrator that is, um, that is uh, based in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, we work with uh, several different school districts and state agencies all throughout the country in education, as well as labor and, and some other areas. And we have a couple of different focus points. So we're, we're in, the, in the development space. Uh, we integrate systems a lot, so um, we'll talk tonight a little bit about that. And then um, equally as important, we're a managed services company where we push in resources into companies, you know, on the IT side, whether it's networks and systems or storage and virtualization, other types of network security items and things like that. So um, just gives you a little bit of my background. So I, I've spent, you know, 20 years in the financial services uh, space, healthcare space, education space, and, uh, and, and the security space. I've run a couple companies. In the cloud, uh, in the cloud space, um, outside of uh, what I do from a work perspective, I do teach at the college level. So I teach uh, cryptography, which is math-based security. So some of you that are that are teachers in the math space, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, you know, Brian, I appreciate the opportunity that you and the and the uh, and the leadership team have given me to uh, to come in and, and take a look around at at, um, at the current environment and see where we can make some adjustments. Today was my first day evaluating the team and the, and the technologies and things like that. So there's a lot more to do. I'll give you kind of a two minute version of this. Um, you know, the people are good. I, I, you know, I think, you know, from the application folks to the, to the technology folks, you have a, a very small team that does a tremendous amount for this school district. And, you know, you should be proud of that. I think that in the limited time I've worked with the team here today, I came away very impressed and, I'm somebody, as Brian will tell you, that is not easy to impress. I'm usually the opposite of that. 
and I'm, I'm more of a contrarian and somebody who's, who's a realist more than anything else. So, um, but I came away pleased with what I saw today. I do think we have some real gaps in the, in sort of the network and systems space, not in who we have on the team, but just in knowledge. Uh, one of the things that Keith did alert me to is, um, you know, in the short time we've been a district and in the short time, you know, since we've dealt with COVID, there hasn't really been an opportunity to document all the things that we're doing, the infrastructure, the technology, the application layer working, you know, you know, talking back to longitudinal systems and things like that. So one of the key areas we're going to have to focus on in addition to shoring up our network and systems knowledge is going to be in, um, in just documenting everything that we do and everything that we have so that, you know, we can, you know, continue to make smart decisions and continue to make sure that we're being good stewards of, of the public's money and things like that. So Brian has tasked me with, um, you know, coming up with an IT strat plan of also looking at the job description for technology. I did make a few changes. I'm going to put them up on the screen here in a second. Again, these are my thoughts and, you know, being in the space. Um, and, uh, and then from there, you know, I'll let the board either make a yay or nay decision to my changes. And then you can, you can adopt that, you know, accordingly. Um, and so, uh, so let me, let me go ahead and very quickly post, um, well, know, well actually, of, actually, I, I just, uh, before you post anything, uh, sure, and I think the ultimate goal here is that when uh, Jim does his work and we do find someone to replace Keith, uh, for the long term, uh, we can basically have some sort of document that we hand over to the person and say, so they can hit the ground running, uh, whoever that may be. So, uh, there, are there any questions for, uh, Jim? I, I just wanted to see if anyone here has any questions uh, to him before he turns over the, uh, puts up the, yeah. the job description. We're, we're happy you're here. Um, we need, <laughs> we need to have this function covered. That's okay. for sure. We're going to go ahead and, uh, I'm just going to share my, uh, my desktop here. All right, so what you have on your screen here is the job description that the, the board um, you know, um, has a copy of, which is the director of technology position. And really from the position objectives, what's really important here, and I've talked to you know, a couple of uh, leaders within the group, I talked to a principal today, and one of the things that we heard um, in stereo was, look, Keith did a really good job for us. And what we want is more of Keith, but what we really need also is you know, to tie the strategy you know, component to that you know, and so one of the things that, you know, um, I agree with is, you know, I want this IT director to be a CIO, right? I want this person to be somebody who is, you know, able to think strategically, is able to digest what teachers are saying, you know, what, what other, you know, paraprofessionals are saying, what principals are saying, and what the leadership team is saying, and be able to distill that into, you know, a cohesive strategy and plan. And then within that team, you have a bunch of really smart people that can execute. And so figuring out ways to, you know, to be able to deliver, you know, those services, whether it's, you know, other infrastructure and application services or it's service management components. I think that there's an opportunity there to improve what we're doing already in the service management side, which is really about how do students and how do parents, you know, make sure that, you know, they get all the resources they need when there's an issue with a Chromebook or something like that. So, you know, those are some areas I think we can really improve upon. Um, walking down through the essential duties and responsibilities, one of the areas I've added was about really shoring up this network and systems virtualization and storage area. Again, there's some, in, it's some surface level knowledge there, but this becomes really important because when we're, you know, we've got 30 applications that are sitting, you know, in our cloud infrastructure or our local infrastructure today. And so, um, you know, we don't have a really strong sense of what that is. We have some sense. Again, the team's doing a great job, but you know, we don't. We're, you know, Keith did a tremendous amount himself in addition to leading the team, and so we've got to shore this knowledge up. I saw that pretty quickly when I was when I was evaluating the team today. Uh, the second piece is, um, you know, I want this leader to really create a backlog of all the different things that that we're we're seeing from you know you know parents and educators and 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 principals and those types of things and and get a list of all the, all the needs that we're hearing about, and then to prioritize those things, to weight them, and then between you know, the prioritization and then the budget consideration, we make decisions about what stays on the truck and what we, we develop against or what we, we purchase or the things that we don't purchase, right? So that's gonna be you know, really important. The last piece is, is that you know, the, the, the district over the last couple of years has done a great job of moving 
you know, things into the cloud. Now, there's a lot of people who get nervous about the cloud, but I can tell you that insource what is core to your business, right? And outsource what is context to your business. So if you don't, if you don't have a good sense of what a student information system is, and it's not core to everything that you do and, and, and you know, and, and all those pieces, then my advice is if, you're, if it's not core in the development of it, then outsource that to people that do it every day that can host it for you, that can update it for you, that can do all those things that, you know, again, limit, you know, the weight of, of, of what you have on that IT team. Because again, the IT team, you know, is, is very resource thin. So you, you, we have to create enough capacity for them to be able to serve the student body the right way. And so I think the district has done an outstanding job in getting some of those critical systems to the cloud while still insourcing or keeping on your own servers, the things that are, you know, that are your special sauce, you know, whether it's the way in which you authenticate in the systems and other things. So I don't want to get too technical here, but those are the areas that I think are, are really important here. And, and, and last but not least is really to look at that, you know, that application strategy and, and coming up with those best of breed technologies, looking at, you know, sort of a Venn diagram of, you know, what you have today, what people want, you know, and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, making decisions about, you know, what stays on the truck from an application perspective and what doesn't. So those are really the three changes that I'd like to see um, in the plan. And, um, you know, uh, just, you know, my, my two cents and, and, you know, again, you know, by all means, um, you know, we can, we can either adopt these changes or, or, or trash these changes either way is okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, should we have so, uh, uh, that, uh, that was, uh, I think that, uh, is all I have on the, the uh, technology director search update and the ask uh, for the board to approve this job responsibility uh, tonight so uh, we can get this out for tomorrow. Very good. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, should we have a motion then to approve the director of technology job description? So moved. So Okay. I'll second. <laughs> Floor Judge moves. Still. Joe seconds. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? Um, um, can, where, where did this, um, how close is this to the um, previous job description? Oh, Chris, you're on the phone, so you weren't able to follow I am, the screen. I, it, yeah, not the screen. I, I have the description that was in the packet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the you tell that's it, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I, you know, um, it's a very good question. One of the um, one of the uh, the things I did was a track changes um, component. So we added three items from a job or from a um, from a central um, you know job description perspective, and then I um, just updated and enhanced the position description at the top of the page. To really include the strategy component in addition to the execution components that you already have in the plan. So it's it's one additional objective component up top, along with three essential criteria that, that I added. Um, I didn't take anything away. The one thing I didn't focus on there, and you won't see it a lot, and this is the area that you know others can help, and I can certainly help as well in my, my limited time here, is on the cybersecurity side. One of the things I committed to Brian and the team was next week I'm going to run a cybersecurity tool called Rapid Fire Tools through um, through the network, and we're going to get a sense for where we are and where we aren't, and what things are really exposures for the for the organization and what things are not. Uh, but those that's a heavy lift that I can do without really you know putting a lot of weight on the team. And I'll come back to you know Brian, and then eventually that'll work its way into you know a board report. The one last thing, Brian, I didn't mention um, really quickly is that. I know you were all talking about, you know, board level training and things like that. One of the things in the future that's going to be important, and I'll come up with this for you, is a little training pack and then eventually maybe a breakout. I'll, I'll talk to Brian about that specifically, but a breakout where we spend a, a few minutes talking about board responsibilities that relates to security and really protecting student data and, and, and student information. And so, you know, that'll be one additional thing that I'll, you know, as part of my job description, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in the short time I'm here. Thank you, Brian. Great. Thanks and very thanks. much. Thank you very much. So, thanks. Chris, uh, 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 there are some changes that, uh, as Jim explained, to the packet. The, um, he went over them in his discussion. 
So if you need them read out, we can do that perhaps I do not, after Kari I has had a chance. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm good with the, uh, with the description. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Kari. So uh, dumb question, but I'll ask it anyway. Do, is, it a board, is it required that the board approve changes to, uh, to this job description? Uh, I uh, I operate under the. Uh, it's a great question to ask. I I operate under the belief that job descriptions should be carefully thought out by management and then uh, given to the uh, board to approve. Uh, and uh, I, what I will say is that a lot of the it, lo it appears if you one of the best practices that I'm aware of is uh, it's always good to have when you post a job description. You should at least in the uh, HR department the year it was approved or updated or revised. And typically the approved part, it usually is something brought to the uh, board as a regular type of thing that you do every, every so often. Um, is, that a, is that an okay answer for you, Kai? Yeah? Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, other, other discussion, Flora? It, just a, a plug that when we post this position, so I, I'm assuming that now you're able to post it. So just to say it out loud of the board, I, I talked briefly with you about this, but to make sure that we post it as, as far as possible, but we also have an eye on diversifying our, our workforce, it, not just as the educators, but just, you know, the, it's important that we start a leadership team, leadership positions. And I see this as that leadership position that we should try to attract, uh, whether it's diverse or linguistic or, you know, gender, any, please. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a great comment that should apply pretty much to everything. Yeah. Um, so, um, are we ready for a vote? All in favor then, please, uh, of approving the job description as modified by, uh, that, that is in the packet as modified by Jim Garrity, just to be specific about um, what it is that we're voting on. Um, please click your yes button. I and say aye. I say aye too. <laughs> Wonderful, the, the telephone members say aye. Um, that's great. So, uh, and I'm seeing all, all yeses and ayes. So, um, it's all yours, Brian. Go for it. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so, just moving on, uh, this is, uh, I know, a topic that we uh, had previously talked about. Uh, this is the Callus Air Ventilation Project. Uh, one thing, you know, it's all in the packet there, but the ultimate goal is we've uh, qualified for full reimbursement from Efficiency Vermont to uh, really help address this matter. Uh, the one big thing is we have to have the project done before the year ends. I believe it was originally December 20th. There is talk that it may be as late as December 30th. Uh, so I know that as, as that, not, that date has changed, so does our conversations regarding when to get this project done. Uh, speaking with the principal, uh, I, I believe there, I see Kat here, good. I'll uh, turn it over to her very shortly, but uh, the, the ultimate goal is uh, we really need to get this project done uh, by the end of this year in order to avoid not having to pay for it with our local taxpayer money. Uh, Kat, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know you've been doing a lot of preparation work and uh, a lot of leadership in this area, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually met with Bill Ford um, today. There have been quite a few pieces that are underway. We started out by um, coming up with uh, a plan about how we might be able to go remote when, when I think the work is at its most rigorous. Um, we've developed some routines and norms around being engaged in learning outdoors and doing so um, appropriately prepared. But I'm envisioning December is going to test that a little bit. Um, uh, and having uh, the ceiling tiles open in a building that is, um, is, is older in some areas than others 
makes me a little un, un, un nervous um, about ensuring safety for all. So it seems to make the most sense, especially as we're, we will likely be in the midst of cold and flu season to take advantage, as Alicia said, about November 3rd for voting day for Callis to really um, have an opportunity to practice what it means to be remote and to do so well. Um, one of the things I am a little nervous about is from the beginning, we have thought about uh, how long it will take to get some of the materials that we need, the equipment that we need. I think a lot of it's coming from overseas. So the, the, the lead time in order to get those orders in is, is hefty and it's already been shifted out um, by at least a week. The, the December break gives us a little bit of wiggle room. So I think that we're still poised to be able to get this job complete on time. Um, and Bill Ford and John Hemmelgarden, the team is working incredibly hard to bring it all together. And of course, Lori's done her magic as she always does around arranging a, a plan for grant funding and then a backup one and then a backup one. And then you all, that's the final backup plan. We're gonna hope to avoid that. Any questions for me? Yeah, um, board member questions for Kat. Sounds like you've, um, Thank like you. you've all got it well thought through. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, Brian, just looking at the, at the agenda, um, I know you've, you've kind of been um, covering multiple items in one go, but um, uh, personnel updates and legislative updates have those been covered? No, yet? not yet. Not yet. I was going to say I was saving them for the the end of my report. Uh, <laughs> and I just want to thank uh, Kat and Lori and Bill Ford for their leadership uh, in this uh, uh, callous ventilation project. Uh, and uh, we'll, um, as things continue to happen, we'll uh, keep you informed. The uh, so the personnel updates uh, kind of goes, uh, and then I'll go into um, the uh, the legislative update. I think we're I. I Sorry for jumping around. I just thought some things could be combined. Uh, so the, the the big thing is I just want to let uh, the, the personnel update is we still have a number of openings uh, in our district. Uh, we're not getting a lot of applicants. Uh, so I, I just want to let the board know um, that it's it's a uh, it's a it's been a challenging year. I mean I think uh, we we're having a lot of success uh, with uh, reopening. We're one of five districts in the state. That has reopened. While a lot of my colleagues around the state are are having conversations about how to reopen, we're we're kind of already there. Uh, but I want to let everyone know that the system is still extremely fragile. Uh, and and I and I and I it's it, you, you I know we come to work, we, we feel like we're we're you know it's we're hey, we're getting we feeling like this uh, new sense of normal here. Uh, but, I, but I'll be completely honest. Uh, there there are some challenges ahead, and I think. With flu season coming up, uh, and, and I said this earlier with my conversation about the remote, uh, with the remote, remote, uh, and making sure we have teachers. Uh, if you know teachers get sick, we don't have a lot of subs, uh, and we don't have a and by uh, and I, and I, what that means basically is I'm on call right now, uh, at, and myself and some of my members of my team are on call starting at 5:30 every morning, and uh, for, for 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 the high school, and then 6:30 every morning for the elementary schools. Uh, to basically waiting to see if we're going to get a call from a principal saying we don't have enough people to staff our building. What can we do today? Uh, so uh, I have received a few of those calls uh, last week. Uh, I, mean, I had to send members from my central office down to certain schools in order to keep them open. Uh, and so, so I just want to let you know it's a very fragile system. We do need subs. Uh, we don't know. We're, we're looking for them. We're, you know, we're putting it out there. Uh, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, if you have any ideas, if, if anyone wants to sub, I don't know, I'm, I'm being completely honest here. Uh, <laughs> so it's a very fragile system. And I, and I just wanted to, to let everyone know that. So that was basically my uh, personnel update for that piece. Thanks very much, Brian. And, and I have to say, um, for those members of your staff who have who have offered and, and actually done the subbing in those schools, I am um, I'm extremely grateful and um, very impressed. Um, it does seem like a high wire 
act that defies gravity at times. Um, but but I, I, I hope um, very much that uh, attention is being paid to the risks of burnout, um, not only for uh, the people who work for you, but also for you that um, you know, self care was a big thing um, last year before any of this really got going. Um, and I think we only need to be all the more focused on, on making sure that um, people don't just burn themselves out or, or you know, um, make too many sacrifices and wind up as a wreck um, as a result. Yeah. And, and I will say that I will be continuing, I will be having conversations with our principals uh, to see how we uh, try to alleviate some staff stress. I mean, I think it's everyone's putting you, teaching is tough to begin with. And then when you're in a pandemic and you're, you're trying to make sure everyone's wearing their mask and they're socially distancing and, you know, you look up and it's time to go home and you're exhausted. Uh, and I also think that the uh, principals and central office administrators and, and staff, not just teachers, but all staff, uh, you know, are very heroic in this, in this regards. Uh, but I also think that uh, I've had conversations with other um, other um, superintendents around here, how do we try to make you know, how do we make things better for our staff uh, as we go through this? You know, especially this, up, this difficult patch that's coming up uh, you know, in, with flu season and in November. Uh, and so, one of the things is that you know I have uh, I've, I've asked uh, members of my leadership team. Uh, you know, sometimes you know I, I know they 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 they're they're up they they come here they come to the board meetings. Uh, one of the things I said is, hey, if you if you need to take the night off, take the night off for your own mental health. Um, yeah, I took I, my my uh, wife had me do that on Saturday night. She said, take the night off. So I I did. I felt much better on Monday. True true story. She's not here, but she can't corroborate it. But a uh, true story. Uh, the uh, the other piece is, uh, you know the uh, you know just I know there's some other things about you know when to respond to email. When should should we be thinking about Having staff members say, "Hey, after a certain time, do you want to respond to email?" Uh, just to give them a break at night. I mean, because you know, when you get that email at nine o'clock, at ten o'clock at night, do you have to respond at that moment? I mean, maybe certain people do, but maybe you know, I, it always goes under the idea if it's not an emergency, right? Uh, we can we can talk about it uh, at some point, maybe the next day, maybe a few days later. Uh, but if it's if it's uh, if it's emergency, obviously maybe it's better to pick up the phone and call. You know, but those are we're, I'm just thinking about some ways that I can support the principals and the leadership team who have not had a summer. Remember, none of them have had a summer. Uh, I mean, and I mean, intense summertime. I think this summer was probably one of the toughest summers uh, in most people's careers trying to plan uh, for the reopening. Um, and I'm just very proud of them. Again, I can't say it enough. Uh, and, and I do get a lot of um, mail from, from, our, from our members of our community. I got, you know, when I send letters out, like I sent one out, someone just wrote, you guys rock. You know, I'm like, that's great. But I'll tell, let me tell the teachers, let me tell uh, the principals because they're the ones on the front lines doing the work every day. Uh, so, you know, so if there's anybody who's interested in subbing, let me know. If you know of anyone, please. Uh, Cause I think that is gonna be the challenge as we move into uh, uh, snow season and flu season. Thank you, Brian. I think as board members, we may need a waiver from the agency of education in order to, but I imagine under these circumstances, they'll be willing to, um, to be, you know, tolerant of this sort of thing. But Chris, I, I see your box lighting up. Do you have something? I do. I have a, a, a Brian, given the, um, it sounds like a very difficult sub, sub situation. Um, have we, just alerted parents to the possibility that uh, there may be a need to quickly shift to either um, remote or close school for a day because we don't have staff staff available. I mean, just just kind of a, a this is a potential, not to alarm anybody, but this is a potential that's coming could come down the road, especially as we get in more into the flu season. Uh, that's a great idea. Uh, I would definitely like to. Uh, consider getting that out in a newsletter uh, very shortly. Okay, I just kind of a forewarned is forewarned. I guess. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Um, Flora. 
just that I, that I'm, I'm just hoping that everybody's following the wellness thing that you guys were doing so that that's still an initiative of your uh, of your leadership team and all the schools because I know you guys have put a lot of work into that so if uh, you know just because of the comments you were making so that people are taking the time they need and following that for for them just not not just for the kids and then maybe if you do a uh, maybe put an announcement in front porch forum <laughs> for maybe post graduates. I don't know if that's because uh, if it comes from you, it might be good. Yep. Okay. Just, uh, I will try. I will. I will do it. <laughs> so, thanks, uh, Jonas. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm going back in, in time a little bit. If you notice, um, my video is flipping in and out because my internet connection is weird, just like everyone else's tonight. Um, and I've just gotten a website loaded that I wanted to look up some information on. Um, and I, I don't want to throw any wrenches into the works. Uh, and uh, Mr. Garrity's presentation was great. Um, the all that sounds great. I I, I do just wonder, uh, Mr. Garrity, you said, you said you were coming from from Delaware. That's correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming from Delaware. Yep. That's correct. Um, did you follow the quarantine rules? Yeah. So, we, you know, for Delaware and Vermont, the rule is, is that for essential personnel and IT being essential personnel, there is no 14 day quarantine period. However, um, I am required. I've, I've done it 90 times uh, since COVID started. Seriously, it's been a, it's been a process where uh, when I come into um, a location, I quarantine until I get my test results back. So I, I took a test prior to coming up here from Delaware, um, quarantined in place. I got the results later that evening. I was negative. When I go back to Delaware, I do the same thing. So I have a Friday morning 9 a.m. test that I have, to, I have to do to make sure I didn't contract something while I was up here. So um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's some pretty you know, significant stipulations there. But if I wasn't in IT and I wasn't considered essential, then um, yeah, I'd be required to, to, to adhere to the, to the 14 days. So no, good question. And you know, it's, uh, you, you know, it, the good thing when I came up here is that, you know, everybody was masked and, and it was, I appreciate, you know, all the safety precautions that went into this. I know people were wiping down door handles all day, tables. I was very impressed in a short period of time, both at the high school and here, um, all the precautions you took. So thank you. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate the answer. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, thanks to you both. Um, uh, other, and I think uh, that other... just goes to show why Vermont is number one in the country uh, in uh, the lowest infection rate. Yeah, uh, and it's a it, it's a constant effort that has to be maintained without, you know, without letting go. And, um, and can I just add that uh, I appreciate Jonas's question because. Uh, uh, I also got phone calls from, you know, I, I, I alerted members of the leadership team. They're like, is he quarantining? What is he doing? And so you know, everyone was all over it, just to let you know. So Exceptional. That was good. <laughs> I really liked it. Yep. Great. Excellent. Um, any other board member uh, questions for Brian on the personnel updates situation in that regard? If not, um, I think we still may have a legislative update. Uh, yeah, I have a legislative update and also just, uh, you know, one of the other things is just to uh, update the board on was uh, the uh, looking at the, you know, we talked about curriculum management um, reviews and that we discussed during the board retreat. Uh, yeah, I just want to let everyone know that I've spoken with every single principal. Uh, we're now in the process of looking at uh, the principals are all very, uh, what's the word, supportive of moving forward. Uh, there, I, th I think everyone's just sit waiting for it to happen. Uh, that we're starting to get into the process of putting specs, soliciting proposals, exploring funding sources, and uh, again, that this is a multi-year initiative, and uh, we should know more about what's happening in this area, hopefully within the next month or so. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, board member questions. If not, does that conclude the superintendent's report? No, I just have the legislative report to go through. Uh -huh. Sorry, I, I know. No, 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 no. quite all right. So uh, basically, I'll go over some of the key highlights of the uh, super of the education legislative report. Uh, this is issue number eleven that uh, came out uh, as as the Vermont legislator legislature 
uh, concluded their work. So the uh, 2020 legislative session was anything but regular. The General Assembly had begun work on several important topics, including the waiting study. However, COVID-19 resulted in a change in course on several fronts. The General Assembly worked through the end of June in order to respond to COVID-19 needs and to develop a quarter one budget. Lawmakers uh, recessed until August 25th, at which time they returned for a special extended session. Uh, the special sen uh, session concluded after five weeks uh, with the finalization of fiscal year 2021 budget bill H969. H969 is the appropriations bill, also known as the big bill, uh, was negotiated in conference committee and the conference, conference report was approved by the House and Senate on September 25th. The bill provides the budget for the state of Vermont for fiscal year 2021, including coronavirus relief fund appropriations for pre-K education, pre-K through 12 education, as noted in the following items. Uh, number one, $103 million to the Agency of Education for Coronavirus Relief Fund eligible pre-K to grade 12 public and approved independent school expenditures in fiscal years 2020 and 2021 through December 30th, 2020. Of this total $103 million appropriation, $1.2 million is allocated to independent schools and $13.5 million is directed to Efficiency Vermont to support and fund school district work to improve air quality in schools by upgrading heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, HVAC. Uh, the remaining $88.3 million is to reimburse school districts for COVID-19 costs through the Coronavirus Relief Fund LEA grant program being administered through the Vermont Agency of Education. If the appropriated CARES Act funding proves to be insufficient to cover all reimbursement requests, any costs for new pandemic expenses shall be fully covered to the extent of appropriated funds. If proration is necessary, it shall be on requests from school districts of uh, repurposed expenses that freed up previously budgeted funds in fiscal year 2021. As used uh, in this section, school district means a school district or regional career technical center. Of these funds, up to $4 million may dis be distributed to the AOE for the purchase of CARES Act eligible supplies and equipment, including vehicles, freezers, and other capital assets necessary to provide meals to children using federal child nutrition programs during this state of emergency. These funds are restricted to costs that exceed the federal per meal reimbursement received for meals provided through these programs. Reimbursement of all allowable transportation expenditures incurred by a school district or supervisory union for the transportation of food and other aid to students, families, and members of the community during the COVID-19 state of emergency provide that if these expenditures were already reimbursed by federal or state fund or state funds, they shall not be reimbursed under these sections. Uh, they also looked at uh, policy issues, and these are some really important policy ones. I know I want to let you know that our, our business administrators all over uh, trying to get these uh, and, and when these updates come in from the state legislature um, with the CARES Act and uh, the COVID-19 funds. But the, uh, the interesting thing I want to point the board members to is the House 969 uh, legislation regarding policy, educational policy. Uh, the first one is establish account, and this is only for 2020 2021 school year. Uh, establish account for average daily membership for each school district, not less than the district's 2019 2020 school year ADM. A reduction of 170 student attendance days for 2020 to 2021 school year. So that may give us some. Uh, 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 leverage in the student days, if we, you know, what we have to make up, what we don't have to make up, uh, depending uh, if we have to close uh, school because we can't, we don't have enough subs for a day, or if we have to, uh, if we have, depending on the winter and, and the snow that could be coming. Uh, so that, that gives us uh, a little more wiggle room. Uh, there is a waiver, uh, and I'm sure our remote teachers uh, will uh, like this from our district. Uh, the waiver of the requirement for teachers to hold an endorsement for online teaching. So that's a big one uh, that they do not have to go get uh, online. They do not have to get a, uh, an endorsement uh, if they're doing that in their in our in our program. Uh, it's nine credits. It, otherwise, they would have had to do nine credits of online learning. Uh, then uh, let's see the and those are some of the major pieces there. Uh, the 
the other piece that I want to share with you is uh, how, how they're addressing potential education fund deficits in fiscal year 2021. So section E111.1 of H969 addresses the annual December 1st letter, which is a requirement of the Vermont Tax Commissioner to consult with the Agency of Education, the Secretary of Administration, and the Joint Fiscal Office when calculating and forecasting a property dollar equivalent yield, an income dollar equivalent yield, and a non-homestead tax. In Act 122, the General Assembly expressed its intent to address any projected deficit in the education fund for fiscal year 2021 by using federal funds, applying reversions, drawing down the stabilization reserve, using other source of sources of revenue, reducing costs, borrowing, or using any other source of funding, including ma making appropriations from the general fund or other funds. This provision in Act 122 was intended to relieve school boards of the responsibility for responding to the projected fiscal year 2021 deficit through school budgeting decisions for fiscal year 2022. Um, so uh, section E111.1 of H969 applies the legislative intent in Act 122 by calling on the tax commissioner to disregard the projected deficit in fiscal year 2021 education fund and to maintain the stabilization reserve at 5% when recommending the state education, statewide education property tax rates. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, some other information, uh, but I'm just uh, gonna go through. The, the other piece was the uh, uniform licensing standards. Uh, S233 simplifies the process of obtaining a Vermont professional educator's license by directing the standards board for professional educators to develop new rules to address applicants with three or more years of practice in good standing in another state and to prescribe a process to assess the equivalence of an applicant's professional credentials earned outside the United States. Uh, this bill amends section 616 VSA 1694 by introducing a new pre-application criminal background determination that would allow potential applicants to know the outcome of the required criminal background checks for licensure and to know whether the potential applicant would be eligible for a license based on the outcome of that check. The bill does not make amendments to current laws requiring criminal background checks for licensure or employment. And uh, this was uh, signed by the governor on September 23rd and takes effect on April 1st, 2021. Thanks. Um, that's pretty comprehensive. And, and it sounds like mostly good news. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there was nothing that I heard regarding amending the Vermont statutes as far as uh, related to consolidation or no, I, have, I, I no, I have not heard anything officially in that regards. Okay. Um, any board member questions on on legislative update? If not, um, I notice it's oh, or Jonas is is that your hand raised? No. Okay. Um, I, I notice it's eight oh nine. Uh, we've been going for two hours. Um, some of you with education quality have been going for three. Um, do you want to continue to plow ahead with a target time of 8.45? Or um, maybe if you need a break, just feel free to, to black out your screen or do whatever you um, makes you comfortable and just grab a bite or a glass of water or whatever. Um, and we can continue going. Um, because I think we're we're into the policy committee is has been um, kicked down towards the bottom of the agenda. So we're now at, um, if I'm not mistaken, at the consent agenda. So um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from our retreat on September 12th and from our board meeting on September 16th? So moved. Thank you, Chris. And um, Brian, sorry, yes. Uh, yes, I would like the board to uh, correct the uh, mistake in the minutes uh, located on page 42 of your packet. Great, Brian, do you mind holding that oh, sorry. just okay. until we sorry. get a second? I'm jumping, sorry. No, no problem. Um, uh, Jael, um, 
I, you have a beautiful cat. Um, but would you like to second that uh, uh, consent agenda? Sure, I'll second it. Wonderful, thanks. I have to um, go feed him. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, now, Brian, please. Sorry, so uh, uh, if you look on page 42 of your board packet, the uh, date for the budget timeline was, uh, it says October 4th, it should read November 4th. Lisa, you got that? I got it, thank you. Great, thank you. Any other changes to the agenda? Minutes? Uh, I'm sorry, to the minutes. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, ask that the, uh, when doing the attendance that they don't use invisible ink because they didn't include me at the board retreat. Maybe that was um, hopeful thinking or wishful thinking, but <laughs> I was there. Uh, and I, I remember you well, Chris. <laughs> Um, yes, so um, Lisa, I know you weren't taking notes on that occasion, but um, yep, I'll, I'll, I'll let Michelle know she can change it easily. So. Very good. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, any, any other changes to the minutes of either of those meetings? If not, we can go to a vote. All in favor of approving the minutes of the 12th and the 16th. Please click yes. Oppose. Aye. Aye. Or, or say aye. Thank you, Dorothy and Chris. And um, I'm seeing all green and hearing all eyes. So the motion carries. The minutes are approved. Um, Lindy, you're usually pretty good about having the board orders um, available. Is that true this time as well? Would you mind making the motion? I always find my cursor here. Um, I make a motion to accept the board orders in the amount, the three hundred eighteen thousand nine hundred eighty-seven dollars eight cents. The next one is for fifteen thousand two hundred twenty-nine dollars ninety-five cents, and the third one is. $77,209.80. Thank you, Lindy. And, and Diane, now you have the magnificent cat. Would you like to second Lindy's motion? I second that before there's a crash behind me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, any questions or, um, or uh, remarks about the board orders? If not, we can go to a vote. All in favor, please click yes or say aye. Um, aye. Opposed. Thank you. Um, and once again, I'm seeing all yeses and, and hearing all ayes. So the motion to approve the board orders carries as well. Um, now, at, we're at the point where um, Chris, Chris's request for an executive session um, so enters Scott, the picture. Scott, yes, Chris. I'm gonna I'm gonna withdraw that request. You're gonna withdraw the request. I withdraw it just because I I, I had misread something. Oh, okay. Um, that's you. absolutely fine. N nobody objects to withdrawing um, the request, do you? I'm I'm not seeing any any expressions of dismay at this prospect. Great. Okay. <laughs> So, um, thank you, Chris. Um, no executive session then. We can move to personnel action, the approval of new teachers uh, and um, so forth. Would, uh, let's see, um, would anyone like to move to approve the new teacher nomination? I can do that, I have it up. Um, I you, make Lydia. a motion to approve the um, employment nomination for Jason Kelly as a math teacher at U32. Wonderful, thanks, Lindy. Any second? I'll second it. Thank you, Jaya. Um, so, uh, discussion of 
Jason Kelly, uh, uh, sort of harking back to a comment of Flores um, about diversity. Um, one area where diversity can manifest itself is in a teacher's background. And I have to say, I really appreciate the, um, the wealth and, and variety of experience of, um, of this math, math teacher. Um, any, any other, uh, Chris? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. The, is, what type of appoint, appointment is this? Because it says, it doesn't say permanent. Uh, I'm not sure, what type of appointment is this? Brian. Uh, yes, all all uh, appointments that occur now in the school year are for the entire school year. Okay. Sure. And only for the entire school year, is that correct? Okay. Thanks. Um, um, there's also, oh, if, also, there's, um, it looks like he has been teaching as a math teacher at the Lar Laraway School in Johnson since April of 2018. Uh, but it also says years of related experience, zero. Is that a typo? Uh, no, it, no, it is not. Uh, that he, He's, he's a, a teacher who's taught in a, a different school, but a public school, uh, this will be his first uh, role in a public school setting. Okay. So just, um, is there an experience rating um, different between public school and a private school? The, the, I, I'm trying to think, is there an experience rating depending on? Yeah, well, it says years of related experience to zero, but his experience um, biography looks like he has about two years of teaching as a math teacher. Uh, yeah, we, we, we calculated that as a, uh, as zero though, for, for this, this hire. Okay. Thank you. So that, that relates to, um, placing him on the pay scale, Brian. Uh, yes, yes. And, uh, and it, it's always, uh, you always want to make sure you, when you're placing folks on a pay scale, uh, you, we are a, uh, unified union school district, right? We have, we work with our labor and, and, uh, we want to make sure that, when you do this kind of work, you're making sure that you're doing it in a way that is fair to the other staff that already work in the district. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, any other questions? If not, we can go to a vote. All in favor of approving Lindy's motion, seconded by Jael to um, to approve the nomination of Jason Kelly as math teacher at U32 for the year. Please click yes. Aye. Oppo or, or say aye. aye. Thank you, Dorothy and Chris. Um, and I see all yeses aye. and hear all <laughs> ayes. Thank you. Great. Um, now, I believe we have uh, a resignation. Um, would anyone like to move that? Oh, Brian. Do you have just want to let the board know that uh, uh, it's effective. The resignation is effective October 16th. October 16th. Okay. 16th. Yeah. Instead of the 23rd. Okay. Yes. No, okay. We're going we're gonna to move so. Um, I, I'm sorry. Did somebody move that that I didn't hear quite? I will move to accept the uh, resignation of Mary Lynn Cross and Stewart as a U32 nurse. Thank you, Jonas. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Lindy it's seconds. Lindy. And um, my, my lights are flickering, so I may be leaving the meeting in a minute. Oh, understood. <laughs> Un under duress. I, I hope you, I hope it passes. Um, so uh, any questions for Brian on this one? Um, is that going to leave U32 short staffed in, from a nursing capacity? Uh, it will. Uh, we are working on it. We may have found a good nurse sub uh, to uh, fill in while we find a uh, active replacement. Uh, and fortunately, we also have our COVID-19 coordinator who has been going over there to help out uh, when necessary. Great. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. 
Thanks. This seems to be an example of where we're stretched thin. Um, so uh, any other questions? If not, we can go to a vote. Uh, uh, all in favor, or, or Dorothy? Um, Dorothy, do you have a question? Uh, no, I wanted to just say aye. Oh, OK. Great. So um, let's vote then. Um, I got Dorothy's aye. And uh, all other yeses. And, and Chris, I didn't hear your aye, but I'm, I hope I'm not I, seeing you too. Wonderful. No, aye. Thank you very aye. much. Thanks, everyone. Um, great. OK, so that um, that leaves us Sorry. With uh, with the second round of public comments, um, are there any public comments uh, to to close this? There, we, we're still going to do as much as we can of policy before we um, conclude in order to listen to the or watch the vice presidential debate. Um, but I have I have two. The first is a telephone, um, one eight zero two, uh, ending in six two two. Um, could you please identify yourself and uh, first click star six to unmute yourself? There you go. Hey there, Corinne in Berlin. Hello, Corinne. So. I'll make this really brief, but I'm really having trouble wrapping around the decision that was made for remote learning. And Brian seemed to speak as if this was something being offered, where to me, it certainly sounded like it was forced and it was unexpected. And it wasn't at all what the families believed would, would be what their student would be doing this year. So I just, I just had to express that even though I don't have a student or even a grandchild in the particular grades that got moved over, I'm just, I'm really shocked. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Corinne. Um, uh, Jessica Hines. Hi, um, I just want to say that it seems pretty clear to me that the superintendent and the board don't seem to really care much about the six um, guiding principles that were laid out for the remote learning option. And it's obvious this decision was made in the best interest of the district and not in the students. And it's very disappointing and discouraging, especially as an employee of this district, um, a parent, and a taxpayer. Um, I'm very disappointed in this decision. This is not how things are done in this um, district. And um, I believe that the board should do something about it and should have a say in it. You were the ones who asked for um, a change. And to say that you don't think it's appropriate now to make a statement or to even ask more questions or to inquire or even talk to the parents or look at different options, I think is a bit ridiculous. And um, I, I, I'm not done with this. This is, this is an unacceptable um, choice for my daughter. And, um, and it, it, I'm discouraged. I'm really disappointed. And as well, I'm shocked. Understood. You just, yeah. um, are there any other public? Um, I see HQ Lane. Could you identify yourself, please? Hi. Yes, my name is Holly Lane. I'm a parent in East Montpelier. Um, sorry, I'm having internet connectivity issues like everyone else. I can't really get my camera on without uh, fading away. Um, I just, I'm a parent of uh, three children in the district and have a child who went through the district and I have a son in fourth grade. 
Um, I want to start by saying that I think Kate Robb is an absolute superstar and superhero. And I feel very frustrated having listened to this conversation. I feel that there was a great disservice. Um, my husband and I wrote two letters to um, Superintendent Olkowski expressing our concern about equity issues and the overcrowding of the classroom. And um, I just feel that this situation was not handled well. I need to echo Jessica Heinz when I say that I feel like the district, it feels like the district made this decision based on a bottom line. And I'm a little shocked because I thought we were a district that was about our kids and not just our pocketbooks. Um, I feel that the fact that Brian Okulski right now is writing notes and not even paying attention to the people who are talking on screen is a huge slap in the face to those of us who just sat through this meeting. Um, we moved to this district because we believe in what this district stands for. And throughout this entire process, families like ours who have chosen to go remote have been shut down with comments like the one with Brian Okulski's message back to me, basically saying, well, why don't you just send your kid back to school? So I would like to echo Jessica Heinz. You know, I sat through this meeting and really thought about whether or not I should make a comment. And I put a lot of faith in a really, in a number of, in this board is full of really smart, compassionate, caring, committed, dedicated people. But I have to ask, what has happened here? And why has it happened this way? And I really feel like this ball was dropped on behalf of any families who had any number of reasons why they might have chosen to go remote. Um, and it wasn't just some, you know, option that we were just granted. And I take exception to things like the comments that the superintendent made in the September 16th meeting about how we're all just worried about our babies. You know, we are worried about our kids. We're worried about many, many things, but mostly right now, I am worried about a group of third graders and a group of fifth graders who are hurting and not understanding that there's no plan to talk to the families of fourth and sixth grade families, even though this has an impact on our children as well. These are their classmates. Um, I don't feel that the teachers were given the appropriate support and tools that they needed to support families and support kids. And I just have to say, I appreciate you taking my comment, but I am unbelievably disappointed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, just, um, it's understood by board members that public comments are, um, that it's not part of a, of a dialogue, but Jonas, you have something that you'd like to, your hand is raised. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that I hear everything that Jessica, I hear what you're saying. Our, our, you know, our kids were classmates for for a minute. Um, during my tenure on the board, there have been a number of times where I have wanted to get involved with the district's decision making, um, but have I, I I have not, um, and the board the, the board has not, and I think that that's those have been wise decisions. Um, a comment was made, uh, you know, a number of months ago when the board was facing a, uh, you know, a difficult situation. Uh, and the comment was that the board stepping in to countermand or, um, take decision-making power away from the superintendent is an extraordinary and fraught process. Um, and I, you know, I just want to go on the record as saying that this is Brian's first year here. Um, I can't begin to imagine the, the difficulty he's had in adapting to, you know, a new place, 
new, you know, new place for his family, you know, new, uh, you know, regs and everything in Vermont, you know, and then, you know, the coronavirus crisis, um, um, it is understandable that people are so upset. Um, hearing that the decision was made, you know, Brian stands by the decision. He says that's his, right? And, and he stands by it alone. It was his call. Um, I think that's appropriate for him to say. But the fact that it was made in consultation with people that I've met over the last couple of years um, um, and, and have a, a, a lot of respect for gives me um, some confidence that while there's a lot of downside to this decision, that the downsides to the other options may have been worse. Um, I don't know that for certain, right? I, you know, I wasn't in a meeting with, you know, Brian and Jen and Kelly and, and, and everyone, um, you know, but, you know, Jessica and Danielle, and I, I, I forget uh, the name of the woman who just spoke, I, I apologize. Um, we, you know, I hear you. I think the board hears you. Um, 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 to, to take action on this would be extraordinary. Um, and, you know, I want to hear more about it, you know, as a parent um, and, and as a board member. Um, but for, for me, you guys, like this is not a place where we can step in and exercise some kind of veto power. You know, all we can do, you know, what we need to do is observe this as it plays out and as the people that we, you know, the guy that we hired, right, and the people that are employed by the district that, you know, you know, they, they need to be free to make their decisions, um, you know, without the fear of the board stepping in and without having to look over their shoulder all the time. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that I agree or disagree with, this, with the decision that was made. Um, um, it's just an extraordinarily difficult thing. Um, and I just don't want the concerned parents to think that the board, or at least me, I don't want you to think that I am, um, indifferent to this, um, or, uh, you know, un uncaring the position that we're in. We don't have a, a, a lot of options. It, it, it seems to me, um, without, taking really extraordinary action. Um, that doesn't, I'm sure that doesn't make you feel any better. Um, I, I, yeah, I see that. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah. that, I, I, I'm sorry. That's, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and I think, I think, thank you, Jonas. Um, uh, and this this is something just as you as you were saying that we'll continue to observe and continue to follow, and it's something I'm sure that the administration will continue to work on. Um, I noticed that there's another member of the public, Brooks Hand, if I have that correctly. Yes, please. Hi, it's Danielle. I, my internet cut out, so I missed the last probably two comments. So I apologize, I can't segue in. Um, I, I wanted to say that earlier when Jen was mentioning about the third grade class, and I'm on a, a, a small detail, but it affects my eight-year-old. So that's why I'm talking about it. But it's not just the difference between synchronous and asynchronous teaching that's happening. It appears to be a mastery learning model that excludes the ability to monitor and adjust in real time with real students at their level. So I see there are communication problems, there are technology problems, there are transition problems, there are tonality problems, and many of those can be ad addressed. I hope they can be addressed. But it's going to boil down to, I think, this mastery learning and perhaps the skills of the teacher within the paradigm she's teaching in. I, I don't think there's malintent anywhere. I don't think there's lack of skill, but we're having a mismatch and a gap. And while there may not be funds that can be spent right now in a way that I would like, 
although I, I do hear about the coronavirus relief fund and I'm not educated about the details and school funding, but I'm wondering if part of this issue can fall under that anywhere, but that's a separate piece. But at, at some point there needs to be, if right now seven out of, six out of seven students have not been able to transfer to the other format, your child was not incorrect about the third grade still being there because they're still there. They can't connect. They can't connect with the relationship of the teacher. They can't connect with how it may be national core standards, but it's not in a way that an eight-year-old can shift to. And so that third grade is still in the classroom because they can't figure it out. Their parents can't figure it out as well. We're right there trying to support them. So, you know, we're melt, I'm, I'm really myopic here. My family's melting down. My eight-year-old is melting down. And I understand the greater good of all students, but I'm living with one of them. And, and that's where my focus is. And I, 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 I um, encourage, okay, so I'm gonna lift off a little bit here too. I encourage, I wanna open the board's mind about remote learning. I've been teaching remotely for 11 years. Um, I, I feel like the investment in, I was so excited to see Canvas that is a critical, I've worked with Blackboard and Moodle and now Canvas. Like I think in terms of making public education relevant for the long haul, for climate change, for the next pandemic, for whatever else we can't see, that if we invest in remote learning, not only Canvas, but people who can teach in it, the district is going to be more agile to meet whatever is coming. And so I, I just want to plant those seeds and ask to really uh, hear that, money would not have been dedicated to another teacher. But if you invest in another teacher who knows how to do this and can teach others, you're not only taking care of my eight-year-old, but you're, I think it provides agility for, for where we're going for the district. And I realize these are hard decisions and I am personally incredibly discouraged, which I will handle on my own. But as we move forward, I please beg of you to keep in mind an eight-year-old and to offer the support that's available. And I appreciate that everybody must be in a really difficult position. Thank you again for the time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jessica, I see your hand is up, but generally we only, we only offer one bite at the apple. Um, I would... I would urge that we make an exception here, um, given the impact that this situation is having on families and children. Uh, and if and, and if she's not blocking anyone else or taking the opportunity from someone else, um, I think we should give Jessica another opportunity to speak. Um, it's it's somewhat of a dialogue, uh, which is is good for us to hear. Um, I, I I should just that's a motion. Uh, well, um, let, let's just sort of do it by uh, consensus of, of board members, um, because this is something that can, um, there's no natural sort of conclusion to this. Um, I, I think the, um, the views have been expressed quite eloquently and movingly. Um, and as Jonas has pointed out, I think, with um, his usual clarity, uh, there's nothing that we're going to be able to do at this point. I, I think the value of hearing what um, what members of the public have to say is uh, in this forum is that administrators here too, and, and their work will continue. <clears throat> and this is like everything else, something that is happening in time and that we need to um, allow time for um, to adjust, to adapt, to, to take whatever additional measures might be necessary. Um, so I, um, with, with my just limitless respect, Chris, I would, um, I would uh, prefer that because of Caitlin, um, 
uh, Usteke um, has also put up her hand. She is, um, she hasn't yet spoken. So I would give her the floor for the moment. Hi, Hi. Um, I'm gonna make a few brief comments and I would be happy to yield my time to Jessica. Um, I'm the parent of a fourth grader in the remote classroom. Um, Scott, your comment tonight that no good deed goes unpunished, I felt was insensitive and harsh. And I would ask you to rethink that sort of commentary. Um, I had asked for the remote school class size to be reconsidered. I felt it was unreasonable. I cc'd all of the board, at least the board members who have an email listed on the website um, in my email. I certainly did not uh, want seven students from my daughter's three, four class to be pushed um, out, which out of the district, which it seems they are being. Um, the superintendent has emphasized that in school is a priority, said that many times in many ways. Um, I'd like to remind you that the remote school, as of the last count I had, had 88 students. This is more than the number of students in Doty or Callis, and that's significant. Everyone should be a priority. There should not be um, this sort of tier of we're not going to consider you as much and um, you know, put the resources there or whatever. Um, I can also say that the uh, fourth graders were not told. I actually found out by going um, and looking at the packet for this board meeting and I saw the memo that Superintendent Okowski wrote to the board September 30th. Um, and it said that students and families had been contacted by the remote school principal. I emailed uh, Gillian to ask, what, I'd like this communication, what is happening? I'm hearing snippets um, as I'm in the same room as my daughter and I, I don't know what's going on. Um, so I just, this is, um, it's pretty upsetting and um, gosh, my heart is going out to these families in the third grade. If it were me, I would be devastated. Um, this needs to be reconsidered. I, I missed the comments at the beginning, but I heard the very tail end. And I heard, uh, I think it was Jessica say that her child was thriving with Ms. Rob. So that's not nothing. Um, so that's what I have to say and I, I hope that you let Jessica speak again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, in the order of things, there would not normally be uh, a second opportunity of public comments. Do I, um, does the board wish to override that? Yes, I I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a number of, of agreements, okay. In that case, Jessica. I apologize for my emotion. I just wanted to, what the one last thing I wanted to say was that I really hope the board members will inquire with the leadership team what was discussed. <clears throat> because I have heard that it was basically a top-down decision with not a lot of input from the other leadership team members, as well as the remote learning principal. The teacher wasn't even, I told the teacher, I told Kate Robb that I had gotten a letter from the, this Vermont, this third grade teacher. She found out by me, which is ridiculous. She hasn't been involved in any of the discussions. This whole situation is just, it's shocking to me. And I just implore you to contact some of the leadership team and to really talk to them about how this all came out. And I've heard over and over tonight that it's not your decision to make, it's whatever, but it's your duty to do your due diligence in this situation. For these students who are suffering because they're being pulled out of their community and put into a different class, it's not okay. 
it's not okay at all. Thank you, Jessica. Um, all right. I'm not seeing any more um, members of the public wishing to comment. So we will move on to um, future agenda items. And I'm wondering if um, one of those future agenda items shouldn't be today's 4.2.1, the first reading of the policies for the policy committee. Um, Chris, may I ask you how you feel about that? Um, that's absolutely fine with me. Um, let me just explain to the board why the format is slightly different in terms of uh, presenting the policies. Uh, and we changed it somewhat so that you that we sent, they went out on Wednesday um, for first reading for this meeting and then to be voted on next meeting to comply with a 10 day production um, 10 day deadline that we needed to meet in order for um, voting on policies. Um, but with that being said, I'm happy to do this next time. If that's if that's the board's desire. Yes, and I, and I think because it's on our agenda, we have to take formal action to put it off to our next meeting, to table it um, until the next meeting. Um, would then, then I'll move to table um, uh, section four point two point one uh, to our next meeting. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chris. Is, is there a second to that I'll motion? Second it. It's Lindy. I'll second. Lindy? Okay. Um, we have two seconds. Lindy is there, and a third. Is there a 12th on that? I, I beg your pardon, Chris? Is there a 12th on that? <laughs> we'll find out soon. <laughs> um, so uh, is there any discussion of this motion to table? If not, please click yes if you're in favor, no if you're opposed, or say aye if you- Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, I have all the yeses and ayes. So um, 4.1 is until our next meeting. Um, any other future agenda items that you'd like to record? Brian. Yes, uh, I have uh, three possible ones. Uh, first one is uh, just continuing to think about central office job descriptions. I may try to be brave and get another job description done between now and then. Uh, the other one is uh, superintendent evaluation, where I think we'll probably have to warn that in executive session. Uh, and I, I don't know, Jonas, uh, Diane, I, I, do we, are we ready? Do you think we'll, or maybe we should talk more about it, but possibly having a negotiations executive session coming up i don't know uh, what you what your thoughts are uh i i, I do think we sh i do think we should um i had a really good conversation with Lori uh the other day um and um to, to set the stage for things you know as we progress into the fall i think it would be good to to fill the board in on where we are thank you that's all i have wonderful there are the lights flickering yeah, our light too. Ours just went off. Oh, yours went off. Howard's oh. out in the middle set. Just went out. Um, hello. Yeah, this is Dorothy too. Yeah, Mine's Dorothy. About to texted me. Just a heads up: the power is off on Collar Hill on its route to Worcester. Oh, great! Yeah, it's flickering here um, on Gould Hill where Jonas and I are. Um, okay. Norton Steve. Road, Scott. Norton Road. Okay, Norton Road, sorry. <laughs> um, so maybe we should adjourn by consensus before the electric company adjourns us for us. Um, any objections? No. If not, many, many thanks to everyone who participated as always. And very best to all for the rest of the week and the weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody. Thank you. Adjourned at 8.50.